The Adventures of Tom Sawyer by Mark Twain Chapter 1 Tom No answer Tom No answer What's gone with that boy, I wonder? You Tom No answer The old lady pulled her spectacles down and looked over them about the room. Then she put them up and looked out under them. She seldom or never looked through them for so small a thing as a boy. They were her state pair, the pride of her heart, and were built for style, not service. She could have seen through a pair of stove lids just as well. She looked perplexed for a moment and then said, not fiercely, but still loud enough for the furniture to hear. Well, I lay if I get hold of you, I'll. She did not finish, for by this time she was bending down and punching under the bed with a broom, and so she needed breath to punctuate the punches with. She resurrected nothing but the cat. I never did see the bee of that boy. She went to the open door and stood in it and looked out among the tomato vines and jimson weeds that constituted the garden. No Tom. So she lifted up her voice at an angle calculated for distance and shouted, I owe you, Tom. There was a slight noise behind her, and she turned just in time to seize a small boy by the slack of his roundabout and arrest his flight. There, I might have thought of that closet. What you been doing in there? Nothing. Nothing. Look at your hands, and look at your mouth. What is that truck? I don't know, aunt. Well, I know. It's jam. That's what it is. Forty times I've said if you didn't let that jam alone, it'd skin you. Hand me that switch. The switch hovered in the air. The peril was desperate. My, look behind you, aunt. The old lady whirled round and snatched her skirts out of danger. The lad fled on the instant, scrambled up the high board fence, and disappeared over it. His aunt Polly stood surprised a moment, and then broke into a gentle laugh. Hang the boy, can I never learn anything? Ain't he played me tricks enough like that for me to be looking out for him by this time? But old fools is the biggest fools there is. Can't learn an old dog new tricks, as the saying is. But my goodness, he never plays them alike. Two days, and how is a body to know what's coming? He appears to know just how long he can torment me before I get my dander up, and he knows if he can make out to put me off for a minute or make me laugh. It's all down again, and I can't hit him a lick. I ain't doing my duty by that boy, and that's the Lord's truth. Goodness knows. Spare the rod and spile the child, as the good book says. I'm a laying up sin and suffering for us both, I know. He's full of the old scratch, but laws of me. He's my own dead sister's boy, poor thing, and I ain't got the heart to lash him somehow. Every time I let him off, my conscience does hurt me so, and every time I hit in my old heart, most breaks. Well, oh well, man that is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble, as the scripture says, and I reckon it's so. He'll play hooky this evening, asterisk and asterisk southwestern for afternoon. I'll just be obliged to make him work tomorrow to punish him. It's mighty hard to make him work Saturdays when all the boys is having holiday, but he hates work more than he hates anything else, and I've got to do some of my duty by him, or I'll be the ruination of the child. Tom did play hooky, and he had a very good time. He got back home barely in season to help Jim, the small colored boy, saw next day's wood and split the kindlings before supper. At least he was there in time to tell his adventures to Jim while Jim did three-fourths of the work. Tom's younger brother, or rather half-brother, Sid was already through with his part of the work, picking up chips, for he was a quiet boy and had no adventurous, troublesome ways. While Tom was eating his supper and stealing sugar as opportunity offered, Aunt Polly asked him questions that were full of guile and very deep, for she wanted to trap him into damaging revealments. Like many other simple-hearted souls, it was her pet vanity to believe she was endowed with a talent for dark and mysterious diplomacy, and she loved to contemplate her most transparent devices as marvels of low cunning. Said she, Tom, it was middling warm in school, warn it? Yes'm. Powerful warm, warn it? Yes'm. Didn't you want to go in a swimming, Tom? A bit of a scare shot through Tom, a touch of uncomfortable suspicion. He searched Aunt Polly's face, but it told him nothing. So he said, No, well, not very much. The old lady reached out her hand and felt Tom's shirt and said, But you ain't too warm now, though, and it flattered her to reflect that she had discovered that the shirt was dry without anybody knowing that that was what she had in her mind. But in spite of her, Tom knew where the wind lay now so we forestalled what might be the next move. Some of us pumped on our heads. Mine's damp yet. See. Aunt Polly was vexed to think she had overlooked that bit of circumstantial evidence and missed a trick. Then she got a new inspiration. Tom, you didn't have to undo your shirt collar where I sewed it to pump on your head, did you? Unbutton your jacket. The trouble vanished out of Tom's face. He opened his jacket. His shirt collar was securely sewed. Bother. Well, go along with you. I'd made sure you played hooky and been a-swimming. But I forgive you, Tom. I reckon you're a kind of a seamed cat, as the saying is, better than you look, this time. 
She was half sorry her sagacity had miscarried and half glad that Tom had stumbled into obedient conduct for once. But Sidney said, Well now, if I didn't think you sewed his collar with white thread, but it's black. Why, I did so with white, Tom. But Tom did not wait for the rest. As he went out at the door, he said, Sidney, I'll lick you for that. In a safe place, Tom examined two large needles which were thrust into the lapels of his jacket and had thread bound about them. One needle carried white thread and the other black. He said, She'd never noticed if it hadn't been for Sid. Confound it. Sometimes she sews it with white, and sometimes she sews it with black. I wish to gee many she'd stick to one or t'other. I can't keep the run of him. But I beg you I'll lay him Sid for that. I'll learn him. He was not the model boy of the village. He knew the model boy very well, though, and loathed him. Within two minutes or even less, he had forgotten all his troubles. Not because his troubles were one whit less heavy and bitter to him than a man's or to a man, but because a new and powerful interest bore them down and drove them out of his mind for the time, just as men's misfortunes are forgotten in the excitement of new enterprises. This new interest was a valued novelty in whistling which he had just acquired from a negro, and he was suffering to practice it undisturbed. It consisted in a peculiar bird-like turn, a sort of liquid warble, produced by touching the tongue to the roof of the mouth at short intervals in the midst of the music. The reader probably remembers how to do it if he has ever been a boy. Diligence and attention soon gave him the knack of it, and he strode down the street with his mouth full of harmony and his soul full of gratitude. He felt much as an astronomer feels who has discovered a new planet, no doubt, as far as strong, deep, unalloyed pleasure is concerned, the advantage was with the boy, not the astronomer. The summer evenings were long, it was not dark yet. Presently Tom checked his whistle. A stranger was before him, a boy a shade larger than himself. A newcomer of any age or either sex was an impressive curiosity in the poor little shabby village of Street Petersburg. This boy was well-dressed, too, well-dressed on a weekday. This was simply astounding. His cap was a dainty thing, his close-buttoned blue cloth roundabout was new and natty, and so were his pantaloons. He had shoes on, and it was only Friday, he even wore a necktie, a bright bit of ribbon. He had a citified air about him that ate into Tom's vitals. The more Tom stared at the splendid marvel, the higher he turned up his nose at his finery and the shabbier and shabbier his own outfit seemed to him to grow. Neither boy spoke. If one moved, the other moved, but only sidewise, in a circle. They kept face to face and eye to eye all the time. Finally, Tom said, I can lick you. I'd like to see you try it. Well, I can do it. No, you can't either. Yes, I can. No, you can't. I can. You can't. Can. Can't. An uncomfortable pause. Then Tom said, What's your name? Tis in any of your business, maybe. Well, I lo, I'll make it my business. Well, why don't you? If you say much, I will. Much. 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 There now. Oh, you think you're mighty smart, don't you? I could lick you with one hand tied behind me if I wanted to. Well, why don't you do it? You say you can do it. Well, I will, if you fool with me. Oh, yes. I've seen whole families in the same fix. Smarty, you think you're some now, don't you? Oh, what hat. You can lump that hat if you don't like it. I dare you to knock it off and anybody that'll take a dare will suck eggs. You're a liar. You're another. You're a fighting liar a dasset take it up. Ah, take a walk. Say, if you give me much more of your sass, I'll take and bounce a rock off in your head. Oh, of course you will. Well, I will. Well, why don't you do it then? What do you keep saying you will for? Why don't you do it? It's because you're afraid. I ain't afraid. You are. I ain't. You are. Another pause and more eyeing and sidling around each other. Presently, they were shoulder to shoulder. Tom said, Get away from here. Go away yourself. I won't. I won't either. So they stood each with a foot placed at an angle as a brace and both shoving with might and main and glowering at each other with hate. But neither could get an advantage. After struggling till both were hot and flushed, each relaxed his strain with watchful caution and Tom said, You're a coward and a pup. I'll tell my big brother on you, and he can thrash you with his little finger, and I'll make him do it too. What do I care for your big brother? I've got a brother that's bigger than he is, and what's more, he can throw him over that fence too. Both brothers were imaginary. That's a lie. You're saying so don't make it so. Tom drew a line in the dust with his big toe and said, I dare you to step over that, and I'll lick you till you can't stand up. Anybody that'll take a dare will steal sheep. The new boy stepped over promptly and said, now you said you'd do it. Now let's see you do it. Don't you crowd me now. You better look out. Well, you said you'd do it. Why don't you do it? By jingo, for two cents I will do it. The new boy took two broad coppers out of his pocket and held them out with derision. 
Tom struck them to the ground. In an instant, both boys were rolling and tumbling in the dirt, gripped together like cats, and for the space of a minute they tugged and tore at each other's hair and clothes, punched and scratched each other's nose, and covered themselves with dust and glory. Presently, the confusion took form, and through the fog of battle, Tom appeared, seated astride the new boy and pounding him with his fists. Holler enough, said he. The boy only struggled to free himself. He was crying, mainly from rage. Holler enough, and the pounding went on. At last, the stranger got out a smothered enough, and Tom let him up and said, Now that'll learn you. Better look out who you're fooling with next time. The new boy went off brushing the dust from his clothes, sobbing, snuffling, and occasionally looking back and shaking his head and threatening what he would do to Tom the next time he caught him out. To which Tom responded with jeers and started off in high feather, and as soon as his back was turned, the new boy snatched up a stone, threw it, and hit him between the shoulders, and then turned tail and ran like an antelope. Tom chased the traitor home, and thus found out where he lived. He then held a position at the gate for some time, daring the enemy to come outside, but the enemy only made faces at him through the window and declined. At last, the enemy's mother appeared and called Tom a bad, vicious, vulgar child and ordered him away. So he went away, but he said he loathed to lay for that boy. He got home pretty late that night, when he climbed cautiously in at the window, he uncovered an ambuscade in the person of his aunt, and when she saw the state his clothes were in her resolution to turn his Saturday holiday into captivity at hard labor became adamantine in its firmness. Chapter 2 Saturday morning was calm, and all the summer world was bright and fresh and brimming with life. There was a song in every heart, and if the heart was young, the music issued at the lips. There was cheer in every face and a spring in every step. The locust trees were in bloom, and the fragrance of the blossoms filled the air. Cardiff Hill, beyond the village and above it, was green with vegetation, and it lay just far enough away to seem a delectable land, dreamy, reposeful, and inviting. Tom appeared on the sidewalk with a bucket of whitewash and a long-handled brush. He surveyed the fence, and all gladness left him, and a deep melancholy settled down upon his spirit, thirty yards of board fence nine feet high. Life to him seemed hollow and existence, but a burden. Sighing, he dipped his brush and passed it along the topmost plank repeated the operation, did it again, compared the insignificant whitewashed streak with the far-reaching continent of unwhitewashed fence, and sat down on a tree box discouraged. Jim came skipping out at the gate with a tin pail and singing buffalo gals. Bringing water from the town pump had always been hateful work in Tom's eyes before, but now it did not strike him so. He remembered that there was company at the pump. White mulatto and negro boys and girls were always there waiting their turns, resting, trading playthings, quarreling, fighting, skylarking. And he remembered that although the pump was only a hundred and fifty yards off, Jim never got back with a bucket of water under an hour, and even then somebody generally had to go after him. Tom said, Say, Jim, I'll fetch the water if you'll whitewash some. Jim shook his head and said, Can't Mars Tom, old missus, she told me I got to go and get dis water and not stop fooling round wid anybody. She say she spec Mars Tom gwine to ax me to whitewash and so she told me go long and tend to my own business. She loathed she tend to do whitewashing. Oh, never you mind what she said, Jim. That's the way she always talks. Give him the bucket. I won't be gone only a minute. She won't ever know. Oh, I dasn't, it, Mars Tom, old missus. She taken tar to head off of me. Deed she would. She, she never licks anybody. Waxing over the head with her thimble. And who cares for that? I'd like to know. She talks awful, but talk don't hurt. Anyways, it don't if she don't cry, Jim. I'll give you a marvel. I'll give you a white alley. She began to waver. White Alley Jim, and it's a bully ta. My, that's a mighty gay marvel, I tell you. But Mars Tom is powerful, frayed old missus. And besides, if you will, I'll show you my sore toe. Jim was only human. This attraction was too much for him. He put down his pail, took the white alley, and bent over the toe with absorbing interest while the bandage was being unwound. In another moment, he was flying down the street with his pail and a tingling rear. Tom was whitewashing with vigor and Aunt Polly was retiring from the field with a slipper in her hand and triumph in her eye. But Tom's energy did not last. He began to think of the fun he had planned for this day and his sorrows multiplied. Soon the free boys would come tripping along on all sorts of delicious expeditions and they would make a world of fun of him for having to work. The very thought of it burnt him like fire. He got out of his worldly wealth and examined it, bits of toys, marbles, and trash. Enough to buy an exchange of work, maybe, but not half enough to buy so much as half an hour of pure freedom. So he returned his straightened means to his pocket and gave up the idea of trying to buy the boys. At this dark and hopeless moment, inspiration burst upon him. Nothing less than a great, magnificent inspiration. He took up his brush and went tranquilly to work. 
Ben Rogers hove in sight presently, the very boy of all boys, whose ridicule he had been dreading. Ben's gait was the hop, skip, and jump, proof enough that his heart was light and his anticipations high. He was eating an apple and giving a long, melodious whoop at intervals, followed by a deep-toned ding-dong-dong, ding-dong-dong, for he was personating a steamboat. As he drew near, he slackened speed, took the middle of the street, leaned far over to starboard, and rounded to ponderously and with laborious pomp and circumstance, for he was personating the big Missouri and considered himself to be drawing nine feet of water. He was boat and captain and engine bells combined, so he had to imagine himself standing on his own hurricane deck, giving the orders and executing them. Stop her, sir. Ting a ling ling. The headway ran almost out and he drew up slowly toward the sidewalk. Ship up to back. Ting a ling ling. His arms straightened and stiffened down his sides. Sever back on the stabboard. Ting a ling ling. Chow. Chow wow cho. His right hand, meantime, describing stately circles. For it was representing a forty foot wheel. Let her go back on the laboard. Ting a ling ling. Chow chow chow. The left hand began to describe circles. Stop the stabboard. Ting a ling ling. Stop the laboard. Come ahead on the stabboard. Stop her. Let your outside turn over slow. Ting a ling ling. Chow wow wow. Get out that headline. Lively now. Come. Out with your spring line. What are you about there? Take a turn round that stump with a bite of it. Stand by that stage now. Let her go. Done with the engines, sir. Ting a ling ling. Shut. Sit. Shut. Trying the gauge cocks. Tom went on whitewashing, paid no attention to the steamboat. Ben stared a moment and then said, Hi, yeah. You're up a stump, ain't you? No answer. Tom surveyed his last touch with the eye of an artist. Then he gave his brush another gentle sweep and surveyed the result as before. Ben ranged up alongside of him. Tom's mouth watered for the apple, but he stuck to his work. Ben said, Hello, old chap, you got to work, hey? Tom wheeled suddenly and said, Why, it's you, Ben. I warned, noticing. Stay, I'm going a swimming, I am. Don't you wish you could? But of course you'd rather work, wouldn't you? Of course you would. Tom contemplated the boy a bit and said, What do you call work? Why, ain't that work? Tom resumed his whitewashing and answered carelessly. Well, maybe it is, and maybe it ain't. All I know is it suits Tom Sawyer. Oh, come now, you don't mean to let on that you like it. The brush continued to move. Like it? Well, I don't see why I oughtn't to like it. Does a boy get a chance to whitewash a fence every day? That put the thing in a new light. Ben stopped nibbling his apple. Tom swept his brush dinkily back and forth, stepped back to note the effect, added a touch here and there, criticized the effect again. Ben watching every move and getting more and more interested, more and more absorbed. Presently he said, Say, Tom, let me whitewash a little. Tom considered was about to consent, but he altered his mind. No, no, I reckon it wouldn't hardly do, Ben. You see, Aunt Polly's awful particular about this fence. Right here on the street, you know. But if it was the back fence, I wouldn't mind and she wouldn't. Yes, she's awful particular about this fence. It's got to be done very careful. I reckon there ain't one boy in a thousand, maybe two thousand, that can do it the way it's got to be done. No, is that so? Oh, come now. Let me just try. Only just a little. I'd let you, if you was me, Tom. Ben, I'd like to, honest and Jun, but Aunt Polly. Well, Jun wanted to do it, but she wouldn't let him... Sid wanted to do it, and she wouldn't let Sid. Now from you see how I'm fixed. If you was to tackle this fence and anything was to happen to it. Oh, shucks, I'll be just as careful. Now let him try. Say, I'll give you the core of my apple. Well here, no Ben, now don't. I'm afraid. I'll give you all of it. Tom gave up the brush with reluctance in his face, but alacrity in his heart. And while the late steamer Big Missouri worked and sweated in the sun, the retired artist sat on a barrel in the shade close by, angled his legs, munched his apple, and planned the slaughter of more innocents. There was no lack of material. Boys happened along every little while. They came to jeer, but remained to whitewash. By the time Ben was fagged out, Tom had traded the next chance to Billy Fisher for a kite in good repair, and when he played out, Johnny Miller bought in for a dead rat and a string to swing it with, and so on, and so on, hour after hour. And when the middle of the afternoon came from being a poor, poverty-stricken boy in the morning, Tom was literally rolling in wealth. He had besides the things before mentioned, qual marbles, part of a Jew's harp, a piece of blue bottle glass to look through, a spool cannon, a key that wouldn't unlock anything, a fragment of chalk, a glass stopper of a decanter, a tin soldier, a couple of tadpoles, six firecrackers, a kitten with only one eye, a brass doorknob, a dog collar, but no dog, the handle of a knife, 
four pieces of orange peel and a dilapidated old window sash. He had had a nice, good idle time all the while, plenty of company, and the fence had three coats of whitewash on it. If he hadn't run out of whitewash, he would have bankrupted every boy in the village. Tom said to himself that it was not such a hollow world after all. He had discovered a great law of human action, without knowing it, namely that in order to make a man or a boy covet a thing, it is only necessary to make the thing difficult to attain. If he had been a great and wise philosopher, like the writer of this book, he would now have comprehended that work consists of whatever a body is obliged to do, and that play consists of whatever a body is not obliged to do. And this would help him to understand why constructing artificial flowers or performing on a treadmill is work, while rolling ten pins or climbing Mont Blanc is only amusement. There are wealthy gentlemen in England who drive four-horse passenger coaches twenty or thirty miles on a daily line in the summer because the privilege costs them considerable money, but if they were offered wages for the service, that would turn it into work and then they would resign. The boy mused a while over the substantial change which had taken place in his worldly circumstances and then wended toward headquarters to report. Chapter 3. Tom presented himself before Aunt Polly, who was sitting by an open window in a pleasant rearward apartment, which was bedroom, breakfast room, dining room, and library combined. The balmy summer air, the restful quiet, the odor of the flowers, and the drowsing murmur of the bees had had their effect, and she was nodding with her knitting. For she had no company but the cat, and it was asleep in her lap. Her spectacles were propped up on her gray head for safety. She had thought that, of course, Tom had deserted long ago, and she wondered at seeing him place himself in her power again in this intrepid way. He said, May I go and play now, aunt? What, already? How much have you done? It's all done, aunt. Tom, don't lie to me. I can't bear it. I ain't aunt. It is all done. Aunt Polly placed small trust in such evidence. She went out to see for herself, and she would have been content to find twenty per cent of Tom's statement true. When she found the entire fence whitewashed, and not only whitewashed, but elaborately coated and recoated, and even a streak added to the ground, her astonishment was almost unspeakable. She said, Well, I never. There's no getting round it. You can work when you're mine to, Tom. And then she diluted the compliment by adding, But it's powerful seldom you're a mine to, I'm bound to say. Well, go long and play, but mind you get back some time a week, or I'll tan you. She was so overcome by the splendor of his achievement that she took him into the closet and selected a choice apple and delivered it to him. Along with an improving lecture upon the added value and flavor a treat took to itself when it came without sin through virtuous effort. And while she closed with a happy scriptural flourish, he hooked a donut. Then he skipped out and saw Sid just starting up the outside stairway that led to the back rooms on the second floor. Clods were handy and the air was full of them in a twinkling. They raged around Sid like a hailstorm, and before Aunt Polly could collect her surprised faculties and sally to the rescue, six or seven clods had taken personal effect, and Tom was over the fence and gone. There was a gate, but as a general thing, he was too crowded for time to make use of it. His soul was at peace, now that he had settled with Sid for calling attention to his black thread and getting him into trouble. Tom skirted the block and came round into a muddy alley that led by the back of his aunt's cow stable. He presently got safely beyond the reach of capture and punishment and hastened toward the public square of the village, where two military companies of boys had met for conflict, according to previous appointment. Tom was general of one of these armies, Joe Harper, a bosom friend, general of the other. These two great commanders did not condescend to fight in person, that being better suited to the still smaller fry, but sat together on an eminence and conducted the field operations by orders delivered through aides to camp. Tom's army won a great victory after a long and hard-fought battle. Then the dead were counted, prisoners exchanged, the terms of the next disagreement agreed upon, and the day for the necessary battle appointed, after which the armies fell into line and marched away, and Tom turned homeward alone. As he was passing by the house where Jeff Thatcher lived, he saw a new girl in the garden. A lovely little blue-eyed creature with yellow hair plaited into two long tails, white summer frock and embroidered pantalettes. The fresh-crowned hero fell without firing a shot. A certain Amy Lawrence vanished out of his heart and left not even a memory of herself behind. He had thought he loved her to distraction. He had regarded his passion as adoration. And behold, it was only a poor little evanescent partiality. He had been months winning her. She had confessed hardly a week ago. He had been the happiest and the proudest boy in the world only seven short days, and here in one instant of time she had gone out of his heart like a casual stranger whose visit is done. He worshipped this new angel with furtive eye, till he saw that she had discovered him, then he pretended he did not know she was present and began to show off in all sorts of absurd boyish ways in order to win her admiration. He kept up this grotesque foolishness for some time, 
But by and by, while he was in the midst of some dangerous gymnastic performances, he glanced aside and saw that the little girl was wending her way toward the house. Tom came up to the fence and leaned on it, grieving and hoping she would tarry yet a while longer. She halted a moment on the steps and then moved toward the door. Tom heaved a great sigh as she put her foot on the threshold. But his face lit up right away, for she tossed a pansy over the fence a moment before she disappeared. The boy ran round and stopped within a foot or two of the flower, and then shaded his eyes with his hand and began to look down the street as if he had discovered something of interest going on in that direction. Presently he picked up a straw and began trying to balance it on his nose, with his head tilted far back, and as he moved from side to side, in his efforts he edged nearer and nearer toward the pansy. Finally his bare foot rested upon it, his pliant toes closed upon it, and he hopped away with the treasure and disappeared round the corner. But only for a minute, only while he could button the flower inside his jacket, next his heart, or next his stomach, possibly, for he was not much posted in anatomy, and not hypercritical, anyway. He returned now and hung about the fence till nightfall, showing off as before, but the girl never exhibited herself again, though Tom comforted himself a little with the hope that she had been near some window, meantime, and been aware of his attentions. Finally, he strode home reluctantly, with his poor head full of visions. All through supper, his spirits were so high that his aunt wondered what had got into the child. He took a good scolding about clotting Sid, and did not seem to mind it in the least. He tried to steal sugar under his aunt's very nose, and got his knuckles wrapped for it. He said, Aunt, you don't whack Sid when he takes it. Well, Sid, don't torment a body the way you do. You'd be always into that sugar if I were him watching you. Presently, she stepped into the kitchen, and Sid, happy in his immunity, reached for the sugar bowl, a sort of glorying over Tom which was well-nigh unbearable. But Sid's fingers slipped and the bowl dropped and broke. Tom was in ecstasies, in such ecstasies that he even controlled his tongue and was silent. He said to himself that he would not speak a word even when his aunt came in, but would sit perfectly still till she asked who did the mischief. And then he would tell, and there would be nothing so good in the world as to see that pet model catch it. He was so brimful of exultation that he could hardly hold himself when the old lady came back and stood above the wreck discharging lightnings of wrath from over her spectacles. He said to himself, now it's coming. And the next instant he was sprawling on the floor. The potent palm was uplifted to strike again when Tom cried out, hold on now, what are you belting me for? Sid broke it. Aunt Polly paused, perplexed, and Tom looked for healing pity. But when she got her tongue again, she only said, umph. Well, you didn't get a lick amiss, I reckon. You've been into some other audacious mischief, when I wasn't around like enough. Then her conscience reproached her, and she yearned to say something kind and loving, but she judged that this would be construed into a confession that she had been in the wrong and discipline forbade that, so she kept silence and went about her affairs with a troubled heart. Tom sulked in a corner and exalted his woes. He knew that in her heart his aunt was on her knees to him, and he was morosely gratified by the consciousness of it. He would hang out no signals, he would take notice of none. He knew that a yearning glance fell upon him, now and then through a film of tears, but he refused recognition of it. He pictured himself lying sick unto death and his aunt bending over him, beseeching one little forgiving word, but he would turn his face to the wall and die with that word unsaid. Ah, how would she feel then? And he pictured himself brought home from the river, dead with his curls all wet and his sore heart at rest. How she would throw herself upon him, and how her tears would fall like rain, and her lips pray God to give her back her boy, and she would never, never abuse him any more. But he would lie there cold and white and make no sign. Poor little sufferer, whose griefs were at an end. He so worked upon his feelings with the pathos of these dreams that he had to keep swallowing, he was so like to choke. And his eyes swam in a blur of water, which overflowed when he winked and ran down and trickled from the end of his nose. And such a luxury to him was this petting of his sorrows that he could not bear to have any worldly cheeriness or any grating delight intrude upon it. It was too sacred for such contact, and so, presently, when his cousin Mary danced in, all alive with the joy of seeing home again and after an age-long visit of one week to the country, he got up and moved in clouds and darkness out at one door as she brought song and sunshine in at the other. He wandered far from the accustomed haunts of boys and sought desolate places that were in harmony with his spirit. A log raft in the river invited him, and he seated himself on its outer edge and contemplated the dreary vastness of the stream, wishing the while that he could only be drowned all at once and unconsciously, without undergoing the uncomfortable routine devised by nature. Then he thought of his flower. He got it out, rumpled and wilted, and it mightily increased his dismal felicity. He wondered if she would pity him if she knew. Would she cry and wish that she had a right to put her arms around his neck and comfort him? Or would she turn coldly away like all a hollow world? 
This picture brought such an agony of pleasurable suffering that he worked it over and over again in his mind and set it up in new and varied lights till he wore it threadbare. At last he rose up sighing and departed in the darkness. About half past nine or ten o'clock he came along the deserted street to where the adored unknown lived. He paused a moment. No sound fell upon his listening ear. A candle was casting a dull glow upon the curtain of a second-story window. Was the sacred presence there? He climbed the fence, threaded his stealthy way through the plants, till he stood under that window. He looked up at it long and with emotion. Then he laid him down on the ground and under it, disposing himself upon his back with his hands clasped upon his breast and holding his poor wilted flower. And thus he would die, out in the cold world, with no shelter over his homeless head, no friendly hand to wipe the death damps from his brow, no loving face to bend pityingly over him when the great agony came. And thus she would see him when she looked out upon the glad morning, and oh, would she drop one little tear upon his poor, lifeless form, would she heave one little sigh to see a bright young life so rudely blighted, so untimely cut down? The window went up, a maidservant's discordant voice profaned the holy calm, and a deluge of water drenched the prone martyr's remains. The strangling hero sprang up with a relieving snort. There was a wez as of a missile in the air, mingled with the murmur of a curse, a sound as of shivering glass followed, and a small, vague form went over the fence and shot away in the gloom. Not long after, as Tom, all undressed for bed, was surveying his drenched garments by the light of a tallow dip, Sid woke up. But if he had any dim idea of making any references to illusions, he thought better of it and held his peace, for there was danger in Tom's eye. Tom turned in without the added vexation of prayers, and Sid made mental note of the omission. Chapter 4 the sun rose upon a tranquil world and beamed down upon the peaceful village like a benediction. Breakfast over, Aunt Polly had family worship. It began with a prayer built from the ground up of solid courses of scriptural quotations, welded together with a thin mortar of originality, and from the sum of this she delivered a grim chapter of the Mosaic Law as from Sinai. Then Tom girded up his loins so to speak and went to work to get his verses. Sid had learned his lesson days before. Tom bent all his energies to the memorizing of five verses, and he chose part of the Sermon on the Mount because he could find no verses that were shorter. At the end of half an hour, Tom had a vague general idea of his lesson, but no more, for his mind was traversing the whole field of human thought, and his hands were busy with distracting recreations. Mary took his book to hear him recite, and he tried to find his way through the fog. Blessed are the, uh, poor. Yes, poor. Blessed are the poor. Uh, in spirit. In spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit. For they, they, Theirs, for theirs. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they, they, sh, for they, say, ah, for they say, oh, I don't know what it is. Shall, oh, shall, for they shall, for they shall, ha, shall mourn. A blessed are they that shall, they that, and they that shall mourn, for they shall, shall what? Why don't you tell me, Mary? What do you want to be so mean for? Oh, Tom, you poor thick-headed thing, I'm not teasing you. I wouldn't do that. You must go and learn it again. Don't you be discouraged, Tom, you'll manage it, and if you do, I'll give you something ever so nice. There now, that's a good boy. All right, what is it? Mary, tell me what it is. Never you mind, Tom. You know if I say it's nice, it is nice. You be here, that's so, Mary. All right, I'll tackle it again. And he did tackle it again. And under the double pressure of curiosity and prospective gain, he did it with such spirit that he accomplished a shining success. Mary gave him a brand new Barlow knife worth twelve and a half cents, and the convulsion of delight that swept his system shook him to his foundations. True, the knife would not cut anything, but it was a sure enough Barlow, and there was inconceivable grandeur in that. Though were the Western boys ever got the idea that such a weapon could possibly be counterfeited to its injury is an imposing mystery and will always remain so, perhaps. Tom contrived to scarify the cupboard with it, and was arranging to begin on the bureau, when he was called off to dress for Sunday school. Mary gave him a tin basin of water and a piece of soap, and he went outside the door and set the basin on a little bench there. Then he dipped the soap in the water and laid it down, turned up his sleeves, poured out the water on the ground gently, and then entered the kitchen and began to wipe his face diligently on the towel behind the door. But Mary removed the towel and said, Now that you ashamed, Tom, you mustn't be so bad. Water won't hurt you. Tom was a trifle disconcerted. The basin was refilled, and this time he stood over it a little while, gathering resolution, took in a big breath, and began. When he entered the kitchen presently, with both eyes shut and groping for the towel with his hands, an honorable testimony of suds and water was dripping from his face. 
But when he emerged from the towel, he was not yet satisfactory, for the clean territory stuck short at his chin and his jaws like a mask. Below and beyond this line, there was a dark expanse of unirrigated soil that spread downward in front and backward around his neck. Mary took him in hand, and when she was done with him, he was a man and a brother, without distinction of color, and his saturated hair was neatly brushed, and its short curls wrought into a dainty and symmetrical general effect. He privately smoothed out the curls with labor and difficulty and plastered his hair close down to his head, for he held curls to be effeminate, and his own filled his life with bitterness. Then Mary got out a suit of his clothing that had been used only on Sundays during two years. They were simply called his other clothes, and so by that we know the size of his wardrobe. The girl put him to rights after he had dressed himself. She buttoned his neat roundabout up to his chin, turned his vast shirt collar down over his shoulders, brushed him off and crowned him with his speckled straw hat. He now looked exceedingly improved and uncomfortable. He was fully as uncomfortable as he looked, for there was a restraint about whole clothes and cleanliness that galled him. He hoped that Mary would forget his shoes, but the hope was blighted. She coated them thoroughly with tallow, as was the custom, and brought them out. He lost his temper and said he was always being made to do everything he didn't want to do. But Mary said persuasively, Please, Tom, that's a good boy. So he got into the shoes snarling. Mary was soon ready, and the three children set out for Sunday school, a place that Tom hated with his whole heart, but Sid and Mary were fond of it. Sabbath school hours were from nine to half past ten, and then church service. Two of the children always remained for the sermon voluntarily, and the other always remained too, for stronger reasons. The church's high-backed, uncushioned pews would see about 300 persons. The edifice was but a small, plain affair with a sort of pine-board tree box on top of the first steeple. At the door, Tom dropped back a step and accosted a Sunday-dressed comrade. Say, Billy, got a yaller ticket. Yes. What do you take for her? What do you give? Piece of licorice and a fish hook. Let's see him. Tom exhibited. They were satisfactory and the property changed hands. Then Tom traded a couple of white alleys for three red tickets and some small trifle or other for a couple of blue ones. He waylaid other boys as they came and went on buying tickets of various colors ten or fifteen minutes longer. He entered the church, now with a swarm of clean and noisy boys and girls, proceeded to his seat and started a quarrel with the first boy that came handy. The teacher, a grave, elderly man, interfered, then turned his back a moment and Tom pulled a boy's hair in the next bench and was absorbed in his book when the boy turned around, stuck a pin in another boy presently in order to hear him say, ouch, I got a new reprimand from his teacher. Tom's whole class were of a pattern, restless, noisy, and troublesome. When they came to recite their lessons, not one of them knew his verses perfectly, but had to be prompted all along. However, they worried through, and each got his reward, in small blue tickets, each with a passage of scripture on it. Each blue ticket was paid for two verses of the recitation. Ten blue tickets equaled a red one and could be exchanged for it. Ten red tickets equaled a yellow one. For ten yellow tickets, the superintendent gave a very plainly bound Bible, worth forty cents in those easy times, to the pupil. How many of my readers would have the industry and application to memorize two thousand verses even for a door Bible? And yet Mary had acquired two Bibles in this way it was the patient work of two years and a boy of German parentage had won four or five. He once recited 3,000 verses without stopping, but the strain upon his mental faculties was too great, and he was little better than an idiot from that day forth. A grievous misfortune for the school, for on great occasions before company, the superintendent, as Tom expressed it, had always made this boy come out and spread himself. Only the older pupils managed to keep their tickets and stick to their tedious work long enough to get a Bible, and so the delivery of one of these prizes was a rare and noteworthy circumstance, the successful pupil was so great and conspicuous for that day that on the spot every scholar's heart was fired with a fresh ambition that often lasted a couple of weeks. It is possible that Tom's mental stomach had never really hungered for one of those prizes, but unquestionably his entire being had for many a day longed for the glory and the eclat that came with it. In due course, the superintendent stood up in front of the pulpit with a closed hymn book in his hand and his forefinger inserted between its leaves and commanded attention. When a Sunday school superintendent makes his customary little speech, a hymn book in the hand is as necessary as is the inevitable sheet of music in the hand of a singer who stands forward on the platform and sings a solo at a concert. The why is a mystery, for neither the hymn book nor the sheet of music is ever referred to by the sufferer. This superintendent was a slim creature of thirty-five with a sandy goatee and short sandy hair. He wore a stiff standing collar whose upper edge almost reached his ears and whose sharp points curved forward abreast the corners of his mouth, a fence that compelled a straight lookout ahead and a turning the whole body on the side view was required. His chin was propped on a spreading cravat, 
which was as broad and as long as a banknote and had fringed ends. His boot toes were turned sharply up in the fashion of the day like sleigh runners, an effect patiently and laboriously produced by the young men by sitting with their toes pressed against a wall for hours together. Mr. Walters was very earnest of mien and very sincere and honest at heart, and he held sacred things and places in such reverence, and so separated them from worldly matters that unconsciously to himself his Sunday school voice had acquired a peculiar intonation which was wholly absent on weekdays, he began after this fashion. Now, children, I want you all to sit up just as straight and pretty as you can and give me all your attention for a minute or two. There. That is it. That is the way good little boys and girls should do. I see one little girl who is looking out of the window. I am afraid she thinks I am out there somewhere, perhaps up in one of the trees making a speech to the little birds. A plus of titter. I want to tell you how good it makes me feel to see so many bright, clean little faces assembled in a place like this, learning to do right and be good, and so forth and so on. It is not necessary to set down the rest of the oration. It was of a pattern which does not vary, and so it is familiar to us all. The latter third of the speech was marred by the resumption of fights and other recreations among certain of the bad boys, and by fidgetings and whisperings that extended far and wide, washing even to the bases of isolated and incorruptible rocks like Sid and Mary. But now every sound ceased suddenly, with the subsidence of Mr. Walter's voice, and the conclusion of the speech was received with a burst of silent gratitude. A good part of the whispering had been occasioned by an event which was more or less rare, the entrance of visitors. Lawyer Thatcher, accompanied by a very feeble and aged man, a fine, portly, middle-aged gentleman with iron-gray hair and a dignified lady who was doubtless the latter's wife. The lady was leaving a child. Tom had been restless and full of chafings and repeatings, conscience smitten too. He could not meet Amy Lawrence's eye, he could not brook her loving gaze. But when he saw this small newcomer, his soul was all ablaze with bliss in a moment. The next moment he was showing off with all his might, cuffing boys, pulling hair, making faces, in a word, using every art that seemed likely to fascinate a girl and win her applause. His exaltation had but one alloy, the memory of his humiliation in this angel's garden, and that record in sand was fast washing out, under the waves of happiness that were sweeping over it now. The visitors were given the highest seat of honor, and as soon as Mr. Walter's speech was finished, he introduced them to the school. The middle-aged man turned out to be a prodigious personage no less a one than the county judge, altogether the most honest creation these children had ever looked upon, and they wondered what kind of material he was made of, and they half wanted to hear of him roar and were half afraid he might too. He was from Constantinople twelve miles away, so if he had traveled and seen the world, these very eyes had looked upon the county courthouse, which was said to have a tin roof. The awe which these reflections inspired was attested by the impressive silence and the ranks of staring eyes. This was the great Judge Thatcher, brother of their own lawyer, Jeff Thatcher immediately went forward to be familiar with the great man and be invited by the school. It would have been music to his soul to hear the whisperings. Look at him, Jim. He's a going up there. Say, look, he's a going to shake hands with him. He is shaking hands with him. By jinx, but you wish he was Jeff. Mr. Walters felt a showing off with all sorts of official bustlings and activities, giving orders, delivering judgments, discharging directions here, there, everywhere that he could find a target. The librarian showed off, running hither and thither, with his arms full of books and making a deal of the splutter and fuss that insect authority delights in. The young lady teachers showed off, bending sweetly over pupils that were lately being boxed, lifting pretty warning fingers at bad little boys and patting good ones lovingly. The young gentlemen teachers showed off with small scoldings and other little displays of authority and fine attention to discipline, and most of the teachers of both sexes found business up at the library by the pulpit, and it was business that frequently had to be done over again two or three times, with much seeming vexation. The little girls showed off in various ways, and the little boys showed off with such diligence that the air was thick with paper wads and the murmur of scufflings. And above it all the great man sat and beamed a majestic judicial smile upon all the house, and warmed himself in the sun in his own grandeur, for he was showing off too. There was only one thing wanting to make Mr. Walter's ecstasy complete, and that was a chance to deliver a Bible prize and exhibit a prodigy. Several pupils had a few yellow tickets, but none had enough. He had been around among the star pupils inquiring. He would have given worlds now to have that German lad back again with a sound mind. And now at this moment, when hope was dead, Tom Sawyer came forward with nine yellow tickets, nine red tickets, and ten blue ones, and demanded a Bible. This was a thunderbolt out of a clear sky. Walters was not expecting an application from this source for the next ten years, but there was no getting around it. Here were the certified checks, and they were good for their face. 
Tom was therefore elevated to a place with the judge and the other elect, and the great news was announced from headquarters. It was the most stunning surprise of the decade, and so profound was the sensation that it lifted the new hero up to the Judicial One's altitude, and the school had two marvels to gaze upon in place of one. The boys were all eaten up with envy, but those that suffered the bitterest pangs were those who perceived too late that they themselves had contributed to this hated splendor by trading tickets to Tom for the wealth he had amassed in selling whitewashing privileges. These despised themselves as being the dupes of a wily fraud, a galful snake in the grass. The prize was delivered to Tom with as much effusion as the superintendent could pump up under the circumstances, but it lacked somewhat of the true gush, for the poor fellow's instinct taught him that there was a mystery here that could not well bear the light, perhaps it was simply preposterous that this boy had warehoused two thousand sheaves of scriptural wisdom on his premises, a dozen would strain his capacity without a doubt. Amy Lawrence was proud and glad, and she tried to make Tom see it in her face, but he wouldn't look, she wondered. Then she was just a grain troubled. Next a dim suspicion came and went, came again. She watched. A furtive glance told her worlds. And then her heart broke, and she was jealous and angry. And the tears came, and she hated everybody. Tom most of all, she thought. Tom was introduced to the judge. But his tongue was tied. His breath would hardly come. His heart quaked. Partly because of the awful greatness of the man, but mainly because he was her parent. He would have liked to fall down and worship him if it were in the dark. The judge put his hand on Tom's head and called him a fine little man and asked him what his name was. The boy stammered, gasped, and got it out. Tom. Oh, no, not Tom. It is. Thomas. Ah, that's it. I thought there was more to it. Maybe. That's very well. But you another one, I dare say, and you'll tell it to me, won't you? Tell the gentleman your other name, Thomas, said Walters, and say, sir. You mustn't forget your manners. Thomas Sawyer, sir. That's it. That's a good boy. Fine boy. Fine, manly little fellow. Two thousand verses is a great many. Very, very great many. And you never can be sorry for the trouble you took to learn them. For knowledge is worth more than anything there is in the world. It's what makes great men and good men. You'll be a great man and good man yourself. Someday, Thomas, and then you'll look back and say, it's all owing to the precious Sunday school privileges of my boyhood. It's all owing to my dear teachers that taught me to learn. It's all owing to the good superintendent who encouraged me and washed over me and gave me a beautiful Bible, a splendid, elegant Bible, to keep and have it all for my own, always. It's all owing to right bringing up. That is what you will say, Thomas, and you wouldn't take any money for those two thousand verses. No, indeed, you wouldn't. And now you wouldn't mind telling me and this lady some of the things you've learned. No, I know you wouldn't. For we are proud of little boys that learn. Now, no doubt you know the names of all the twelve disciples. Won't you tell us the names of the first two that were appointed? Tom was tugging at a buttonhole and looking sheepish. He blushed now and his eyes fell. Mr. Walter's heart sank within him. He said to himself, it's not possible that the boy can answer the simplest question. Why did the judge ask him? Yet he felt obliged to speak up and say, Answer the gentleman, Thomas, don't be afraid. Tom still hung fire. Now I know you'll tell me, said the lady. The names of the first two disciples were David and Golia. Let us draw the curtain of charity over the rest of the scene. Chapter 5 About half past ten, the cracked bell of the small church began to ring, and presently the people began to gather for the morning sermon. The Sunday school children distributed themselves about the house and occupied pews with their parents so as to be under supervision. Aunt Polly came, and Tom and Sid and Mary sat with her, Tom being placed next the aisle in order that he might be as far away from the open window and the seductive outside summer scenes as possible. The crowd filed up the aisles, the aged and needy postmaster, who had seen better days, the mayor and his wife, for they had a mayor there among other unnecessaries, the justice of the peace, the widow Dudless, fair, smart, and forty, a generous, good-hearted soul and well-to-do, her hill mansion the only palace in the town, and the most hospitable, and much the most lavish in the matter of festivities that Street Petersburg could boast, the bent and venerable major and Mrs. Ward, lawyer Riverson, the new notable from a distance, next the bell of the village, followed by a troop of lawn-clad and ribbon-decked young heartbreakers, then all the young clerks in town in a body, for they had stood in the vestibule sucking their cane heads, a circling wall of oiled and simpering admirers, till the last girl had run their gantlet, and last of all came the model boy, Willie Mufferson, taking as heedful care of his mother as if she were cut glass. He always brought his mother to church, and was the pride of all the matrons. The boys all hated him, he was so good, and besides, he had been thrown up to them so much. His white handkerchief was hanging out of his pocket behind, as usual on Sundays, accidentally. 
Tom had no handkerchief, and he looked upon boys who had as snobs. The congregation being fully assembled, now the bell rang once more to warn laggards and stragglers, and then a solemn hush fell upon the church, which was only broken by the tittering and whispering of the choir in the gallery. The choir always tittered and whispered all through service. There was once a church choir that was not ill-bred, but I have forgotten where it was now. It was a great many years ago, and I can scarcely remember anything about it, but I think it was in some foreign country. The minister gave out the hymn and read it through with a relish, in a peculiar style which was much admired in that part of the country. His voice began on a medium key and climbed steadily up till it reached a certain point, where it bore with strong emphasis upon the topmost word and then plunged down as if from a springboard. Shall I be car ride to the skies on flowery beds of ease, whilst others fight to win the prize and sail through bloody seas? He was regarded as a wonderful reader. At church sociables, he was always called upon to read poetry, and when he was through, the ladies would lift up their hands and let them fall helplessly in their laps and wall their eyes and shake their heads as much as to say, words cannot express it. It is too beautiful, too beautiful for this mortal earth. After the hymn had been sung, the Reverend Mr. Sprague turned himself into a bulletin board and read off notices of meetings and societies and things till it seemed that the list would stretch out to the crack of doom, a queer custom which is still kept up in America even in cities, away here in this age of abundant newspapers. Often, the less there is to justify a traditional custom, the harder it is to get rid of it. And now the minister prayed. A good, generous prayer it was and went into details. It pleaded for the church and the little children of the church, for the other churches of the village, for the village itself, for the county, for the state, for the state officers, for the United States, for the churches of the United States, for Congress, for the president, for the officers of the government, for poor sailors, tossed by stormy seas, for the oppressed millions groaning under the heel of European monarchies and oriental despotisms, for such as have the light and the good tidings and yet have not eyes to see nor ears to hear withal, for the heathen in the far islands of the sea, and close with a supplication that the words he was about to speak might find grace and favor and be a seed sown in fertile ground, yielding in time a grateful harvest of good. Amen. There was a rustling of dresses and the standing congregation sat down. The boy whose history this book relates did not endure the prayer, he only endured it, if he even did that much. He was restive all through it. He kept tally of the details of the prayer unconsciously, for he was not listening, but he knew the ground of old and the clergyman's regular route over it. And when a little trifle of new matter was interlarded, his ear detected it and his whole nature resented it. He considered additions unfair and scoundrelly. In the midst of the prayer, a fly had lit on the back of the pew in front of him and tortured his spirit by calmly rubbing its hands together embracing its head with its arms and polishing it so vigorously that it seemed to almost part company with the body and the slender thread of a neck was exposed to view, scraping its wings with its hind legs and smoothing them to its body as if they had been coattails, going through its whole toilet as tranquilly as if it knew it was perfectly safe, as indeed it was. For as sorely as Tom's hands itched to grab for it, they did not dare. He believed his soul would be instantly destroyed if he did such a thing while the prayer was going on. But with the closing sentence, his hand began to curve and steal forward, and the instant the amen was out, the fly was a prisoner of war. His aunt detected the act and made him let it go. The minister gave out his text and droned along monotonously through an argument that was so prosy that many a head by and by began to nod. And yet, it was an argument that dealt in limitless fire and brimstone and thinned the predestined elect down to a company so small as to be hardly worth the saving. Tom counted the pages of the sermon. After church, he always knew how many pages there had been, but he seldom knew anything else about the discourse. However, this time he was really interested for a little while. The minister made a grand and moving picture of the assembling together of the world's hosts at the millennium when the lion and the lamb should lie down together and a little child should lead them. But the pathos, the lesson, the moral of the great spectacle were lost upon the boy. He only thought of the conspicuousness of the principal character before the onlooking nations. His face lit with the thought, and he said to himself that he wished he could be that child if it was a tame lion. Now he lapsed into suffering again as the dry argument was resumed. Presently, he bethought him of a treasure he had and got it out. It was a large black beetle with formidable jaws. A pinch bug, he called it. It was in a percussion cap box. The first thing the beetle did was to take him by the finger. A natural fillet followed, the beetle went floundering into the aisle and lit on its back, and the hurt finger went into the boy's mouth. The beetle lay there working its helpless legs, unable to turn over. Tom eyed it and longed for it but it was safe out of his reach. Other people uninterested in the sermon found relief in the beetle, and they eyed it too. 
Presently, a vagrant poodle dog came idling along, sad at heart, lazy with the summer softness and the quiet, weary of captivity, sighing for change. He spied the beetle. The drooping tail lifted and wagged. He surveyed the prize, walked around it, smelt at it from a safe distance, walked around it again, grew bolder and took a closer smell, then lifted his lip and made a gingerly snatch at it, just missing it, made another and another, began to enjoy the diversion, subsided to his stomach with the beetle between his paws and continued his experiments, grew weary at last and then indifferent and absent-minded. His head nodded and little by little his chin descended and touched the enemy who seized it. There was a sharp yelp, a flirt of the poodle's head, and the beetle fell a couple of yards away and lit on its back once more. The neighboring spectators shook with a gentle inward joy. Several faces went behind fans and handkerchiefs and Tom was entirely happy. The dog looked foolish and probably felt so, but there was resentment in his heart, too, and a craving for revenge. So he went to the beetle and began a wary attack on it again, jumping at it from every point in a circle lighting with his four paws within an inch of the creature, making even closer snatches at it with his teeth and jerking his head till his ears flapped again. But he grew tired once more after a while, tried to amuse himself with the fly, but found no relief, followed an ant around, with his nose close to the floor and quickly wearied of that, yawned, sighed, forgot the beetle entirely, and sat down on it. Then there was a wild yelp of agony and the poodle went sailing up the aisle. The yelps continued and so did the dog. He crossed the house in front of the altar, he flew down the other aisle, he crossed before the doors, he clambered up the home stretch. His anguish grew with his progress, till presently he was but a woolly comet moving in its orbit with the gleam and the speed of light. At last the frantic sufferer sheared from its course and sprang into its master's lap. He flung it out of the window and the voice of distress quickly thinned away and died in the distance. By this time the whole church was red-faced and suffocating with suppressed laughter, and the sermon had come to a dead standstill. The discourse was resumed presently, but it went lame and halting, all possibility of impressiveness being at an end, for even the gravest sentiments were constantly being received with a smothered burst of unholy mirth, under cover of some remote pewback, as if the poor parson had said a rarely facetious thing. It was a genuine relief to the whole congregation when the ordeal was over and the benediction pronounced. Tom Sawyer went home quite cheerful, thinking to himself that there was some satisfaction about divine service when there was a bit of variety in it. He had but one marrying thought. He was willing that the dog should play with his pinch bug, but he did not think it was upright in him to carry it off. Chapter 6. Monday morning found Tom Sawyer miserable. Monday morning always found him so because it began another week's slow suffering in school. He generally began that day with wishing he had had no intervening holiday and made the going into captivity and fetters again so much more odious. Tom lay thinking. Presently it occurred to him that he wished he was sick and he could stay home from school. Here was a vague possibility. He canvassed his system. No ailment was found, and he investigated again. This time, he thought he could detect Kaliki symptoms, and he began to encourage them with considerable hope. But they soon grew feeble, and presently died wholly away. He reflected further. Suddenly, he discovered something. One of his upper front teeth was loose. This was lucky. He was about to begin to groan as a starter, as he called it, when it occurred to him that if he came into court with that argument, his aunt would pull it out, and that would hurt. So he thought he would hold the tooth in reserve for the present and seek further. Nothing offered for some little time, and then he remembered hearing the doctor tell about a certain thing that laid up a patient for two or three weeks and threatened to make him lose a finger. So the boy eagerly drew his sore toe from under the sheet and held it up for inspection. But now he did not know the necessary symptoms. However, it seemed well worth while to chance it, so he fell to groaning with considerable spirit. But Sid slept on unconscious. Tom groaned louder and fancied that he began to feel pain in the toe. No result from Sid. Tom was panting with his exertions by this time. He took a rest and then swelled himself up and fetched a succession of admirable groans. Sid snored on. Tom was aggravated. He said, Sid, Sid, and shook him. This course worked well, and Tom began to groan again. Sid yawned, stretched, then brought himself up on his elbow with a smirk and began to stare at Tom. Tom went on groaning. Sid said, Tom, say Tom. No response. Here, Tom, Tom. What is the matter, Tom? And he shook him and looked in his face anxiously. Tom moaned out, Oh, don't sit. Don't joggle me. Why? What's the matter, Tom? I must call auntie. No, never mind. They'll be over by and by, maybe. Don't call anybody. But I must. Don't groan so, Tom. It's awful. How long you been this way? Hours. Ouch. Oh, don't stir so, Sid. You'll kill me. Tom, why didn't you wake me sooner? Oh, Tom, don't. It makes my flesh crawl to hear you. Tom, what's the matter? 
I forgive you everything, Sid. Grown. Everything you've ever done to me. When I'm gone. Oh, Tom, you ain't dying, are you? Don't, Tom. Oh, don't. Matey. I forgive everybody, Sid. Grown. Tell him so, Sid. And Sid, you give my window sash and my cat with one eye to that new girl that's come to town and tell her. But Sid had snatched his clothes and gone. Tom was suffering in reality now, so handsomely was his imagination working. And so his groans had gathered quite a genuine tone. Sid flew downstairs and said, Oh, Aunt Polly, come. Tom's dying. Dying. Yism. Don't wait. Come quick. Rubbage. I don't believe it. But she fled upstairs, nevertheless, with Sid and Mary at her heels, and her face grew white too, and her lip trembled. When she reached the bedside, she gasped out, You Tom. Tom. What's the matter with you? Oh, Auntie, um. What's the matter with you? What is the matter with you, child? Oh, Auntie, my sore toes mortified. The old lady sank down into a chair and laughed a little, then cried a little, then did both together. This restored her, and she said, Tom, what a turn you did give me. Now you shut up that nonsense and climb out of this. The groans ceased and the pain vanished from the toe. The boy felt a little foolish and he said, Aunt Polly, it seemed mortified and it hurt so I never minded my tooth at all. Your tooth indeed. What's the matter with your tooth? One of them's loose and it aches perfectly awful. There, there now, don't begin that groaning again. Open your mouth. Well, your tooth is loose, but you're not going to die about that. Mary, get me a silk thread and a chunk of fire out of the kitchen. Tom said, Oh, please, Auntie, don't pull it out. It don't hurt any more. I wish I may never stir if it does. Please don't, Auntie. I don't want to stay home from school. Oh, you don't, don't you? So all this row was because you thought you'd get to stay home from school and go a-fishing? Tom, Tom, I love you so, and you seem to try every way you can to break my old heart with your outrageousness. By this time, the dental instruments were ready. The old lady made one end of the silk thread fast to Tom's tooth with a loop and tied the other to the bedpost. Then she seized the chunk of fire and suddenly thrust it almost into the boy's face. The tooth hung dangling by the bedpost now. But all trials bring their compensations. As Tom went into school after breakfast, he was the envy of every boy he met because the gap in his upper row of teeth enabled him to expectorate in a new and admirable way. He gathered quite a following of lads interested in the exhibition, and one that had cut his finger and had been a center of fascination and homage up to this time, now found himself suddenly without an adherent and shorn of his glory. His heart was heavy and he said with a disdain which he did not feel that it wasn't anything to spit like Tom Sawyer, but another boy said, sour grapes, and he wandered away a dismantled hero. Shortly Tom came upon the juvenile pariah of the village, Huppleberry Finn, son of the town drunkard. Huppleberry was cordially hated and dreaded by all the mothers of the town, because he was idle and lawless and vulgar and bad, and because all their children admired him so and delighted in his forbidden society and wished they dared to be like him. Tom was like the rest of the respectable boys in that he invited Huppleberry his gaudy outcast condition and was under strict orders not to play with him. So he played with him every time he got a chance. Huckleberry was always dressed in the cast-off clothes of full-grown men, and they were in perennial bloom and fluttering with rags. His hat was a vast ruin with a wide crescent lopped out of its brim. His coat, when he wore one, hung nearly to his heels and had the rearward buttons far down the back, but one suspender supported his trousers, the seat of the trousers bagged low and contained nothing, the fringed legs dragged in the dirt when not rolled up. Huckleberry came and went at his own free will. He slept on doorsteps in fine weather and in empty hogsheads in wet. He did not have to go to school or to church or call any being master or obey anybody. He could go fishing or swimming when and where he chose and stay as long as it suited him. Nobody forbade him to fight. He could sit up as late as he pleased. He was always the first boy that went barefoot in the spring and the last to resume leather in the fall. He never had to wash nor put on clean clothes. He could swear wonderfully. In a word, everything that goes to make life precious that boy had. So thought every harassed, hampered, respectable boy in Street Petersburg. Tom hailed the romantic outcast. Hello, Huppleberry. Hello yourself and see how you like it. What's that you got? A cat that already died. Let me see him, Huck. My, he's pretty stiff. Where'd you get him? Bought him off in a boy. What did you give? I give a blue ticket and a bladder that I got at the slaughterhouse. Where'd you get the blue ticket? Bought it off in Ben Rogers two weeks ago for a hoop stick. Say... What is this good for, Huck? Good for? Cure warts with. No. Is that so? I know something that's better. I bet you don't. What is it? Why? Spunk water. Spunk water. I wouldn't give a dern for spunk water. You wouldn't, wouldn't you? Do you ever try it? No. 
A hint. But Bob Tanner did. Who told you so? Why, he told Jeff Thatcher, and Jeff told Johnny Baker, and Johnny told Jim Hollis, and Jim told Ben Rogers, and Ben told a black guy, and the black guy told me. They're now. Well, what of it? They'll all lie. Leastways all but the black guy. I don't know him. But I never see them that wouldn't lie. Shucks. Now you tell me how Bob Tanner done it. Huck. Why, he took and dipped his hand in a rotten stump where the rainwater was. In the daytime. Certainly. With his face to the stump. Yes, at least I reckon so. Did he say anything? I don't reckon he did. I don't know. Ha ha. Talk about trying to cure warts with spunk water such a blame fool way as that. Why then ain't a going to do any good? You got to go all by yourself to the middle of the woods, where you know there's a spunk water stump, and just as it's midnight you back up against the stump and jam your hand in and say, Barley corn, barley corn, engine meal shorts, spunk water, spunk water, swallow these warts. And then walk away quick, eleven steps, with your eyes shut, and then turn around three times and walk home without speaking to anybody. Because if you speak, the charm's busted. Well, that sounds like a good way, but that ain't the way Bob Tanner done. No, sir, you can bet he didn't, because he's the wartiest boy in this town, and you wouldn't have a wart on him if he knowed how to work spunk water. I took off thousands of warts off of my hands that way, huck. I play with frogs so much that I've always got considerable many warts. Sometimes I take them off with a bean. Yes, beans good. I've done that. Have you? What's your way? You take and split the bean, and cut the wart so as to get some blood, and then you put the blood on one piece of the bean and take and dig a hole and bury it about midnight at the crossroads in the dark of the moon, and then you burn up the rest of the bean. You see that piece that's got the blood on it will keep drawing and drawing, trying to fetch the other piece to it, and so that helps the blood to draw the wart, and pretty soon off she comes. Yes, that's it. Huck, that's it. Though when you're burying it, if you say down bean, off wart, come no more to bother me. It's better. That's the way Joe Harper does, and he's been nearly to Coonville and most everywheres. But say, how do you cure him with cats? Why, you take your cat and go and get in the graveyard long about midnight when somebody that was wicked has been buried. And when it's midnight, a devil will come, or maybe two or three, but you can't see him. You can only hear something like the wind, or maybe hear him talk. And when they're taking that feller away, you heave your cat after him and say, Devil follow corpse, cat follow devil, warts follow cat, I'm done with ye, that'll fetch any wart. Sounds right. Do you ever try it, Uck? No, but old mother Hopkins told me. Well, I reckon it's so then, because they say she's a witch. Say, why, Tom, I know she is. She witched Pap. Pap says so of his own self. He come along one day and he sees she was a witching him, so he took up a rock, and if she hadn't dodged, he had got her. Well, that very night, he rolled off in a shed where he was a-laying drunk and broke his arm. Why, that's awful. How did he know she was a-witching him? Lord, Pap can tell, easy. Pap says when they keep looking at you right stiddy, they're a-witching you. Especially if they mumble. Because when they mumble, they're saying the Lord's prayer backwards. Say, hockey, when you're going to try a cat. Tonight, I reckon they'll come after old Hoss Williams tonight. But they buried him Saturday. Did they get him Saturday night? Why, how you talk? How could their charms work till midnight? And then it's Sunday. Devils don't slosh around much of a Sunday, I don't reckon. I never thought of that. That's so. Lembe with you. Of course, if you ain't a furred. A furred taint likely, will you meow? Yes, and you meow back if you get a chance. Last time you kept me in mowing around till old Hayes went to throwing rocks at me and says, Dern that cat. And so I hove a brick through his window. But don't you tell. I won't. I couldn't mail that night because auntie was watching me, but I'll mail this time. Stay. What's that? Nothing but a tick. Where'd you get him? Out in the woods. what do you take for him? I don't know. I don't want to sell him. All right. It's a mighty small tick, anyway. Oh, anybody can run a tick down that don't belong to them. I'm satisfied with it. It's a good enough tick for me. Show. Sure, there's ticks aplenty. I've got a thousand of them if I wanted to. Well, why don't you? Because you know mighty well you can't. This is a pretty early tick, I reckon. It's the first one I've seen this year. Say, Huck, I'll give you my tooth for him. Let's see it. Tom got out a bit of paper and carefully unrolled it. Huckleberry viewed it wistfully. The temptation was very strong. At last, he said, Is it genuine? Tom lifted his lip and showed the vacancy. Well, all right, said Huckleberry, it's a trade. Tom enclosed the tick in the percussion cap box that had lately been the pinchbug's prison, and the boys separated, each feeling wealthier than before. 
When Tom reached the little isolated frame schoolhouse, he strode in briskly, with the manner of one who had come with all honest speed. He hung his hat on a peg and flung himself into his seat with business-like alacrity. The master, thrown on high in his great splint-bottom armchair, was doozing, lulled by the drowsy hum of study. The interruption roused him. Thomas Sawyer. Tom knew that when his name was pronounced in full, it meant trouble. Sir, come up here. Now, sir, why are you late again, as usual? Tom was about to take refuge in a lie when he saw two long tails of yellow hair hanging down a back that he recognized by the electric sympathy of love, and by that form was the only vacant place on the girl's side of the schoolhouse. He instantly said, I stopped to talk with Huckleberry Finn. The master's pulse stood still and he stared helplessly. The buzz of study ceased. The pupils wondered if this foolhardy boy had lost his mind. The master said, You. You did what? Stop to talk with Huckleberry Finn. There was no mistaking the words. Thomas Sawyer, this is the most astounding confession I have ever listened to. No mere ferule will answer for this offense. Take off your jacket. The master's arm performed until it was tired and the stock of switches notably diminished. Then the order followed. Now, sir, go and sit with the girls and let this be a warning to you. The titter that rippled around the room appeared to abash the boy, but in reality that result was caused rather more by his worshipful awe of his unknown idol and the dread pleasure that lay in his high good fortune. He sat down upon the end of the pine bench and the girl hitched herself away from him with a toss of her head. Nudges and winks and whispers traversed the room, but Tom sat still with his arms upon the long, low desk before him and seemed to study his book. By and by attention ceased from him, and the accustomed school murmur rose upon the dull air once more. Presently, the boy began to steal furtive glances at the girl. She observed it, made a mouth at him, and gave him the back of her head for the space of a minute. When she cautiously faced around again, a peach lay before her. She thrust it away. Tom gently put it back. She thrust it away again, but with less animosity. Tom patiently returned it to its place. Then she let it remain. Tom scrawled on his slate, Please take it. I got more. The girl glanced at the words, but made no sign. Now the boy began to draw something on the slate, hiding his work with his left hand. For a time, the girl refused to notice, but her human curiosity presently began to manifest itself by hardly perceptible signs. The boy worked on, apparently unconscious. The girl made a sort of non-committal attempt to see, but the boy did not betray that he was aware of it. At last, she gave in and hesitatingly whispered, Let me see it. Tom partly uncovered a dismal caricature of a house with two gable ends to it and a corkscrew of smoke issuing from the chimney. Then the girl's interest began to fasten itself upon the work, and she forgot everything else. When it was finished, she gazed a moment, then whispered, It's nice. Make a man. The artist erected a man in the front yard that resembled a derrick. He could have stepped over the house, but the girl was not hypercritical. She was satisfied with the monster and whispered, It's a beautiful man. Now make me coming along. Tom drew an hourglass with a full moon and straw limbs to it and armed the spreading fingers with a portentous fan. The girl said, it's ever so nice. I wish I could draw. It's easy, whispered Tom. I'll learn you. Oh, will you? At noon? Do you go home to dinner? I'll stay if you will. Good. That's a whack. What's your name? Becky Thatcher. What's yours? Oh, I know. It's Thomas Sawyer. That's the name they licked me by. I'm Tom when I'm good. You call me Tom, will you? Yes. Now Tom began to scrawl something on the slate, hiding the words from the girl. But she was not backward this time. She begged to see. Tom said, Oh, it ain't anything. Yes, it is. No, it ain't. You don't want to see. Yes, I do. Indeed, I do. Please let me. You'll tell. No, I won't. Deed and deed and double deed won't. You won't tell anybody at all. Ever. As long as you live. No, I won't ever tell anybody. Now let me. Oh, you don't want to see. Now that you treat me so, I will see. And she put her small hand upon his and a little scuffle ensued, Tom pretending to resist in earnest, but letting his hands slip by degrees till these words were revealed. I love you. Oh, you bad thing. And she gave his hand a smart rap, but reddened and looked pleased, nevertheless. Just at this juncture, the boy felt a slow, fateful grip closing on his ear and a steady lifting impulse. In that wise, he was borne across the house and deposited in his own seat, under a peppering fire of giggles from the whole school. Then the master stood over him during a few awful moments and finally moved away to his throne without saying a word. But although Tom's ear tingled, his heart was jubilant. As the school quieted down, Tom made an honest effort to study, but the turmoil within him was too great. In turn, he took his place in the reading class and made a botch of it, then in the geography class and turned lakes into mountains, mountains into rivers, and rivers into continents, till chaos was come again. 
been in the spelling class and got turned down by a succession of mere baby words till he brought up at the foot and yielded up the pewter medal which he had worn with ostentation for months. Chapter 7 The harder Tom tried to fasten his mind on his book, the more his ideas wandered. So at last, with a sigh and a yawn, he gave it up. It seemed to him that the noon recess would never come. The air was utterly dead. There was not a breath stirring. It was the sleepiest of sleepy days. The drowsing murmur of the five-and-twenty studying scholars soothed the soul like the spell that is in the murmur of bees. Away off in the flaming sunshine, Cardiff Hill lifted its soft green sides through a shimmering veil of heat, tinted with the purple of distance. A few birds floated on lazy wing high in the air. No other living thing was visible but some cows, and they were asleep. Tom's heart ached to be free or else to have something of interest to do to pass the dreary time. His hand wandered into his pocket and his face lit up with a glow of gratitude that was prayer, though he did not know it. Then furtively the percussion cap box came out. He released the tick and put him on the long, flat desk. The creature probably glowed with a gratitude that amounted to prayer, too, at this moment, but it was premature. For when he started thankfully to travel off, Tom turned him aside with a pin and made him take a new direction. Tom's bosom friend sat next to him, suffering just as Tom had been, and now he was deeply and gratefully interested in this entertainment in an instant. This bosom friend was Joe Harper. The two boys were sworn friends all the week and embattled enemies on Saturdays. Joe took a pin out of his lapel and began to assist in exercising the prisoner. The sport grew in interest momently. Soon Tom said that they were interfering with each other and neither getting the fullest benefit of the tick. So he put Joe's slate on the desk and drew a line down the middle of it from top to bottom. Now, said he, as long as he is on your side, you can stir him up and I'll let him alone. But if you let him get away and get on my side, you're to leave him alone as long as I can keep him from crossing over. All right, go ahead. Start him up. The tick escaped from Tom presently and crossed the equator. Joe harassed him a while, and then he got away and crossed back again. This change of base occurred often. While one boy was worrying the tick with absorbing interest, the other would look on with interest as strong. The two heads bowed together over the slate, and the two souls dead to all things else. At last, luck seemed to settle and abide with Joe. The tick tried this, that, and the other course and got as excited and as anxious as the boys themselves. But time and again, just as he would have victory in his very grasp, so to speak, and Tom's fingers would be twitching to begin, Joe's pin would deftly head him off and keep possession. At last, Tom could stand it no longer. The temptation was too strong, so he reached out and lent a hand with his pin. Joe was angry in a moment, said he. Tom, you let him alone. I have only just want to stir him up a little, Joe. No, sir, ain't fair, you just let him alone. Blame it, I ain't going to stir him much. Let him alone, I tell you, I won't. You shall, he's on my side of the line. Look here, Joe Harper, who's is that tick? I don't care whose tick he is, he's on my side of the line, and you shan't touch him. Well, I'll just bet I will, though. He's my tick, and I'll do what I blame please with him, or die. A tremendous whack came down on Tom's shoulders and its duplicate on Joe's, and for the space of two minutes the dust continued to fly from the two jackets and the whole school to enjoy it. The boys had been too absorbed to notice the hush that had stolen upon the school a while before when the master came tiptoeing down the room and stood over them. He had contemplated a good part of the performance before he contributed his bit of variety to it. When school broke up at noon, Tom flew to Becky Thatcher and whispered in her ear, Pour on your bonnet and let on your going home, and when you get to the corner, give the rest of him the slip and turn down through the lane and come back. Other the other way and come it over him the same way. So the one went off with one group of scholars and the other with another. In a little while the two met at the bottom of the lane, and when they reached the school they had it all to themselves. Then they sat together with a slate before them, and Tom gave Becky the pencil and held her hand in his, guiding it, and so created another surprising house. When the interest in art began to wane, the two felt it talking. Tom was swimming in bliss. He said, Do you love rats? No, I hate them. Well, I do too, live ones. But I mean dead ones, to swing round your head with a string. No, I don't care for rats much anyway. What I like is chewing gum. Oh, I should say so. I wish I had some now. Give you. I got some. I'll let you chew it a while, but you must give it back to me. That was agreeable, so they chewed a turnabout and dangled their legs against the bench in excess of contentment. Was you ever at a circus, said Tom. Yes, and my pa's going to take me again some time if I'm good. I've been to the circus three or four times, lots of times. Church ink shucks to a circus. There's things going on at a circus all the time. I'm going to be a clown in a circus when I grow up. Oh, are you? That will be nice. They're so lovely, all spotted up. Yes, that's so. And they get slathers of money. 
most a dollar a day, Ben Rogers says, say, Becky, was you ever engaged? What's that? Why, engaged to be married? No. Would you like to? I reckon so. I don't know. What is it like? Like? Why it ain't like anything. You only just tell a boy you won't ever have anybody but him, ever, 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 and then you kiss, and that's all. Anybody can do it. Kiss? What do you kiss for? Why, that you know this too well. They always do that. Everybody. Why, yes, everybody that's in love with each other. Do you remember what I wrote on the slate? Ye. Yes. What was it? I shan't tell you. Shall I tell you? Ye. Yes. But some other time? No now. No, not now, tomorrow. Oh, no now, please, Becky. I'll whisper it. I'll whisper it. Ever so easy. Becky hesitating, Tom took silence for consent and passed his arm about her waist and whispered the tale ever so softly with his mouth close to her ear. And then he added, Now you whisper it to me, just the same. She resisted for a while and then said, You turn your face away so you can't see, and then I will. But you mustn't ever tell anybody, will you, Tom? Now you won't, will you? No, indeed, indeed I won't. Now, Becky. He turned his face away. She bent timidly around till her breath stirred its curls and whispered, I love you. Then she sprang away and ran around and around the desks and benches with Tom after her and took refuge in a corner at last with her little white apron to her face. Tom clasped her about her neck and pleaded, Now, Becky, it's all done. All over but the kiss. Don't you be afraid of that. It ain't anything at all. Please, Becky. And he tugged at her apron and the hands. By and by she gave up and let her hands drop, her face all glowing with the struggle, came up and submitted. Tom kissed the red lips and said, Now it's all done, Becky, and always after this, you know, you ain't ever to love anybody but me, and you ain't ever to marry anybody but me, ever, never, and forever. Will you? No, I'll never love anybody but you, Tom, and I'll never marry anybody but you, and you ain't to ever marry anybody but me, either. Certainly, of course, that's part of it. And always coming to school or when we're going home, you're to walk with me. When there ain't anybody looking, you choose me and I choose you at parties, because that's the way you do when you're engaged. It's so nice. I never heard of it before. Oh, it's ever so gay. Why, me and Amy Lawrence? The big eyes told Tom his blunder and he stopped confused. Oh, Tom, then I ain't the first you've ever been engaged to. The child began to cry. Tom said, Oh, don't cry, Becky. I don't care for her anymore. Yes, you do, Tom. You know you do. Tom tried to put his arm about her neck, but she pushed him away and turned her face to the wall and went on crying. Tom tried again with soothing words in his mouth and was repulsed again. Then his pride was up and he strode away and went outside. He stood about, restless and uneasy for a while, glancing at the door every now and then, hoping she would repent and come to find him. But she did not. Then he began to feel badly and fear that he was in the wrong. It was a hard struggle with him to make new advances now, but he nerved himself to it and entered. She was still standing back there in the corner, sobbing with her face to the wall. Tom's heart smote him. He went to her and stood a moment, not knowing exactly how to proceed. Then he said hesitatingly, Becky, I, I don't care for anybody but you. No reply, but sobs. Becky, pleadingly, Becky, won't you say something? More sobs. Tom bat out his chiefest jewel, a brass knob from the top of an andiron and passed it around her so that she could see it and said, Please, Becky, won't you take it? She struck it to the floor. Then Tom marched out of the house and over the hills and far away to return to school no more that day. Presently, Becky began to suspect. She ran to the door. He was not in sight. She flew around to the play yard. He was not there. Then she called, Tom. Come back, Tom. She listened intently, but there was no answer. She had no companions but silence and loneliness. So she sat down to cry again and upbraid herself. And by this time, the scholars began to gather again and she got to hide her griefs and still her broken heart and take up the cross of a long, dreary, aching afternoon with none among the strangers about her to exchange sorrows with. Chapter 8 Tom dodged hither and thither through lanes until he was well out of the track of returning scholars and then fell into a moody jog. He crossed a small branch two or three times because of a prevailing juvenile superstition that to cross water baffled pursuit. Half an hour later, he was disappearing behind the Douglas mansion on the summit of Cardiff Hill, and the schoolhouse was hardly distinguishable away off in the valley behind him. He entered a dense wood, picked his pathless way to the center of it, and sat down on a mossy spot under a spreading oak. There was night in his effort stirring. The dead noonday heat had even stilled the songs of the birds. Nature lay in a trance that was broken by no sound but the occasional far-off hammering of a woodpecker, 
and this seemed to render the pervading silence and sense of loneliness the more profound. The boy's soul was steeped in melancholy, his feelings were in happy accord with his surroundings. He sat long with his elbows on his knees and his chin in his hands, meditating. It seemed to him that life was but a trouble, at best, and he more than half invited Jimmy Hodges, so lately released. It must be very peaceful, he thought, to lie in slumber and dream forever and ever, with the wind whispering through the trees and caressing the grass and the flowers over the grave and nothing to bother and grieve about ever any more. If he only had a clean Sunday school record, he could be willing to go and be done with it all. Now as to this girl, what had he done? Nothing. He had meant the best in the world and been treated like a dog, like a very dog. She would be sorry some day, maybe when it was too late. Ah, if he could only die temporarily. But the elastic heart of youth cannot be compressed into one constrained shape long at a time. Tom presently began to drift insensibly back into the concerns of this life again. What if he turned his back now and disappeared mysteriously? What if he went away, ever so far away, into unknown countries beyond the seas, and never came back any more? How would she feel then? The idea of being a clown occurred to him now only to fill him with disgust. For frivolity and jokes and spotted tights were an offense when they intruded themselves upon a spirit that was exalted into the vague august realm of the romantic. No, he would be a soldier and return after long years all war-worn and illustrious. No, better still, he would join the Indians and hunt buffaloes and go on the warpath in the mountain ranges and the trackless great plains of the far west and away in the future come back a great chief, bristling with feathers, hideous with paint and prance into Sunday school, some drowsy summer morning with a blood-curdling war-whoop and sear the eyeballs of all his companions with unappeasable envy. But no, there was something gaudier even than this. He would be a pirate. That was it. Now his future lay plain before him and glowing with unimaginable splendor. How his name would fill the world and make people shudder. How gloriously he would go plowing the dancing seas in his long, low, black-hulled racer, the spirit of the storm with his grisly flag flying at the fore, and at the zenith of his fame, how he would suddenly appear at the old village and stalk into church, brown and weather-beaten in his black velvet doublet and trunks, his great jackboots, its crimson sash, his belt bristling with horse pistols, his crime-rusted cutlass at his side, his slouch hat with waving plumes, his black flag unfurled with the skull and crossbones on it, and here with swelling ecstasy the whisperings, it's Tom Sawyer the parrot, the black avenger of the Spanish main. Yes, it was settled. His career was determined. He would run away from home and enter upon it. He would start the very next morning. Therefore, he must now begin to get ready. He would collect his resources together. He went to a rotten log near at hand and began to dig under one end of it with his barlow knife. He soon struck wood that sounded hollow. He put his hand there and uttered this incantation impressively. What hasn't come here, come. What's here, stay here. Then he scraped away the dirt and exposed a pine shingle. He took it up and disclosed a shapely little treasure house whose bottom and sides were of shingles. In it lay a marble. Tom's astonishment was bound less. He scratched his head with a perplexed air and said, Well, that beats anything. Then he tossed the marble away pettishly and stood cogitating. The truth was that a superstition of his had failed, here, which he and all his comrades had always looked upon as infallible. If you bury a marble with certain necessary incantations, and left it alone fortnight, and then opened the place with the incantation he had just used, you'd find that all the marbles you had ever lost had gathered themselves together there meantime, no matter how widely they had been separated. But now this thing had actually and unquestionably failed. Tom's whole structure of faith was shaken to its foundations. He had many a time heard of this thing succeeding, but never of its failing before. It did not occur to him that he had tried it several times before himself, but could never find the hiding places afterward. He puzzled over the matter some time and finally decided that some witch had interfered and broken the charm. He thought he would satisfy himself on that point, so he searched around till he found a small sandy spot with a little fumble shake depression in it. He laid himself down and put his mouth close to this depression and called. Doodlebug, doodlebug, tell me what I want to know. Doodlebug, doodlebug, tell me what I want to know. The sand began to work and presently a small black bug appeared for a second and then darted under again in a fright. He doesn't tell, so it was a witch that done it. I just noted. it. He well knew the futility of trying to contend against witches, so he gave up discouraged. But it occurred to him that he might as well have the marble he had just thrown away, and therefore he went and made a patient search for it. But he could not find it. Now he went back to his treasure house and carefully placed himself just as he had been standing when he tossed the marble away. Then he took another marble from his pocket and tossed it in the stained way, saying, Brother, go find your brother. He watched where it stopped and went there and looked. But it must have fallen short or gone too far, 
so he tried twice more. The last repetition was successful. The two marbles lay within a foot of each other. Just here, the blast of a toy tin trumpet came faintly down the green aisles of the forest. Tom flung off his jacket and trousers, turned his suspender into a belt, raked away some brush behind the rotten log, disclosing a rude bow and arrow, a lath sword, and a tin trumpet, and in a moment had seized these things and bounded away, bare-legged with fluttering shirt. He presently halted under a great elm, blew an answering blast, and then began to tiptoe and look warily out this way and that. He said cautiously, to an imaginary company, Hold, my merry men. Keep hid till I blow. Now appeared Joe Harper as airily clad and elaborately armed as Tom. Tom called, Hold, who comes here to Sherwood Forest without my pass. Guy of Gisborne wants no man's pass. Who art thou that fat? Dares to hold such language, said Tom, prompting, for they talk by the book from memory. Who art thou that dares to hold such language? I indeed. I am Robin Hood, as thy caitiff carcase soon shall know. Then art thou indeed that famous outlaw? Right gladly will I dispute with thee the passes of the merry wood. Have it thee. They took their last swords, dumped their other traps on the ground, struck a fencing attitude, foot to foot, and began a grave, careful combat, two up and two down. Presently Tom said, Now you got the hang, go it lively. So they went it lively, panting and perspiring with the work. By and by Tom shouted, Fall, fall, why don't you fall? I shan't. Why don't you fall yourself? You're getting the worst of it. Why, that ain't anything. I can't fall. That ain't the way it is in the book. The book says, Then with one backhanded stroke he slew poor Guy of Gisborne. Your turn around and let me hit you in the back. There was no getting around the authority, so Joe turned, received the whack, and fell. Now, said Joe, getting up, you got to let me kill you. That's fair. Why, I can't do that. It ain't in the book. Well, it's blame me. That's all. Well, say, Joe, you can be Friar Tuck or much the miller's son, and lamb me with a quarter staff, or I'll be the sheriff of Nottingham, and you be Robin Hood a little while and kill me. This was satisfactory, and so these adventures were carried out. Then Tom became Robin Hood again, and was allowed by the treacherous nun to bleed his strength away through his neglected wound. And at last Joe, representing a whole tribe of weeping outlaws, dragged him sadly forth, gave his bow into his feeble hands, and Tom said, where this arrow falls, there bury poor Robin Hood under the greenwood tree. Then he shot the arrow and fell back and would have died, but he lit on a nettle and sprang up too gaily for a corpse. The boys dressed themselves, hid their accoutrements, and went off grieving that there were no outlaws any more and wondering what modern civilization could claim to have done to compensate for their loss. They said they would rather be outlaws a year in Sherwood Forest than President of the United States forever. Chapter 9 At half past nine that night, Tom and Sid were sent to bed as usual. They said their prayers and Sid was soon asleep. Tom lay awake and waited in restless impatience. When it seemed to him that it must be nearly daylight, he heard the clock strike ten. This was despair. He would have tossed and fidgeted, as his nerves demanded, but he was afraid he might wake Sid. So he lay still and stared up into the dark. Everything was dismally still. By and by, out of the stillness, little, scarcely perceptible noises began to emphasize themselves. The ticking of the clock began to bring itself into notice. Old beams began to crack mysteriously. The stairs creaked faintly. Evidently spirits were abroad. A measured muffled snore issued from Aunt Polly's chamber. And now the tiresome chirping of a cricket that no human ingenuity could locate began. Next the ghastly ticking of a death watch in the wall at the bed's head made Tom shudder. It meant that somebody's days were numbered. Then the howl of a far-off dog rose on the night air and was answered by a fainter howl from a remoter distance. Tom was in an agony. At last he was satisfied the time had ceased and eternity begun, he began to doze in spite of himself. The clock chimed eleven, but he did not hear it. And then there came, mingling with his half-formed dreams in most melancholy caterwauling. The raising of a neighboring window disturbed him, a cry of scat, you devil. And the crash of an empty bottle against the back of his aunt's wood brought him wide awake, and a single minute later he was dressed and out of the window and creeping along the roof of the L on all fours. He meowed with caution once or twice as he went, then jumped to the roof of the woodshed and thence to the ground. Huckleberry Finn was there with his dead cat. The boys moved off and disappeared in the gloom. At the end of half an hour, they were wading through the tall grass of the graveyard. It was a graveyard of the old-fashioned western kind. It was on a hill, about a mile and a half from the village. It had a crazy board fence around it, which leaned inward in places and outward the rest of the time, but stood upright nowhere. Grass and weeds grew rank over the whole cemetery. All the old graves were sunken in, there was not a tombstone on the place, round-topped, warm-eaten boards staggered over the graves, leaning for support and finding none. 
sacred to the memory of so-and-so had been painted on them once, but it could no longer have been read, on the most of them, now even if there had been light. A faint wind moaned through the trees, and Tom feared it might be the spirits of the dead, complaining of being disturbed. The boys talked little and only under their breath for the time and the place and the pervading solemnity and silence oppressed their spirits. They found the sharp new heap they were seeking and ensconced themselves within the protection of three great elms that grew in a bunch within a few feet of the grave. Then they waited in silence for what seemed a long time. The hooting of a distant owl was all the sound that troubled the dead stillness. Tom's reflections grew oppressive. He must force some talk. So he said in a whisper, Hucky, do you believe the dead people like it for us to be here? Huckleberry whispered, I wish I knowed. It's awful solemn-like, ain't it? I bet it is. There was a considerable pause while the boys canvassed this matter inwardly. Then Tom whispered, Say, Hucky, do you reckon Hoss Williams hears us talking? Of course he does. Least his spirit does. Tom, after a pause, I wish I'd said Mr. Williams, but I never meant any harm. Everybody calls him Hoss. A body can't be too particular how they talk about these your dead people, Tom. This was a damper, and conversation died again. Presently, Tom seized his comrade's arm and said, Sh, what is it, Tom? And the two clung together with beating hearts. Sh, there tis again. Didn't you hear it? Aye, there. Now you hear it. Lord, Tom, they're coming. They're coming, sure. What we do? I don't know. Think they'll see us? Oh, Tom, they can see in the dark, same as cats. I wish I hadn't come. Oh, don't be afraid. I don't believe they'll bother us. We ain't doing any harm. If we keep perfectly still, maybe they won't notice us at all. I'll try to Tom, but Lord, I'm all of a shiver. Listen. The boys bent their heads together and scarcely breathed. A muffled sound of voices floated up from the far end of the graveyard. Look. See there, whispered Tom. What is it? It's devil fire. Oh, Tom, this is awful. Some vague figures approached through the gloom, swinging an old-fashioned tin lantern that freckled the ground with innumerable little spangles of light. Presently, Huckleberry whispered with a shudder. It's the devils, sure enough. Three of them, Lordy Tom, were goners. Can you pray? I'll try, but don't you be afraid. They ain't going to hurt us. Now I lay me down to sleep, I... Shh. What is it, Huck? They're humans. One of them is anyway. One of them's old Muff Potter's voice. No taint so, is it? I bet I know it. Don't you stir nor budge. He ain't sharp enough to notice us. Drunk the same as usual, likely blamed old Rip. All right, I'll keep still. Now they're stuck. Can't find it. Here they come again. Now they're hot. Cold again. Hot again. Red hot. They're pinted right, this time. Say, Huck, I know another of them voices. It's Injun Joe. That's so, that murderin' half-breed. I'd druther they was devils a dern sight. What kin they be up to? The whisper died wholly out now, for the three men had reached the grave and stood within a few feet of the boy's hiding place. Here it is, said the third voice, and the owner of it held the lantern up and revealed the face of young Dr. Robinson. Potter and Injun Joe were carrying a hand barrow with a rope and a couple of shovels on it. They cast down their load and began to open the grave. The doctor put the lantern at the head of the grave and came and sat down with his back against one of the elm trees. He was so close the boys could have touched him. Hurry, men, he said in a low voice. The moon might come out any moment. They growled a response and went on digging. For some time there was no noise but the grating sound of the spades discharging their freight of mold and gravel. It was very monotonous. Finally a spade struck upon the coffin with a dull, witty accent, and within another minute or two the men had hoisted it out on the ground. They pried off the lid with their shovels, got out the body, and dumped it rudely on the ground. The moon drifted from behind the clouds and exposed the pallid face. The barrow was got ready and the corpse placed on it, covered with a blanket and bound to its place with the rope. Potter took out a large spring knife and cut off the dangling end of the rope and then said, Now the cuss thing's ready, sawbones, and you'll just out with another five or here she stays. That's the talk, said Injun Joe. Look here, what does this mean, said the doctor. You required your pay in advance and have paid you. Yes, and you done more than that, said Injun Joe, approaching the doctor, who was now standing. Five years ago, you drove me away from your father's kitchen one night when I come to ask for something to eat and you said I weren't there for any good. And when I swore I'd get even with you if it took a hundred years, your father had me jailed for a vagrant. Did you think I'd forget? The engine blood ain't in me for nothing. And now I've got you and got to settle, you know. He was threatening the doctor with his fist in his face by this time. The doctor struck out suddenly and stretched the ruffian on the ground. Potter dropped his knife and exclaimed, Here now, don't you hit my pard. 
and the next moment he had grappled with the doctor and the two were struggling with might and main, trampling the grass and tearing the ground with their heels. Injun Joe sprang to his feet, his eyes flaming with passion, snatched up Potter's knife and went creeping cat-like and stooping round and round about the combatants, seeking opportunity. All at once the doctor flung himself free, seized the heavy headboard of William's grave and felled Potter to the earth with it. And in the same instant the half-breed saw his chance and drove the knife to the hilt in the young man's breast. He reeled and fell partly upon Potter, flooding him with his blood, and in the same moment the clouds blotted out the dreadful spectacle, and the two frightened boys went speeding away in the dark. Presently, when the moon emerged again, Injun Joe was standing over the two forms, contemplating them. The doctor murmured inarticulately, gave a long gasp or two and was still. The half-breed muttered, That score is settled. Damn you. Then he robbed the body after which he put the fatal knife in Potter's open right hand and sat down on the dismantled coffin. Three, four, five minutes passed, and then Potter began to stir and moan. His hand closed upon the knife. He raised it, glanced at it, and let it fall with a shudder. Then he sat up, pushing the body from him, and gazed at it and then around him, confusedly. His eyes met Joe's. Lord, how is this, Joe? He said. It's a dirty business, said Joe, without moving. What did you do it for? I, I never done it. Look here. That kind of talk won't wash. Potter trembled and grew white. I thought it got sober. I'd no business to drink tonight, but it's in my head yet. Worse than when we started here. I'm all in muddle. Can't recollect anything of it, hardly. Tell me, Joe. Honest, now old feller. Did I do it? Joe, I never meant to. Pawn my soul and honor. I never meant to, Joe. Tell me how it was, Joe. Oh, it's awful, and him so young and promising. Why, you two was scuffling and he fetched you one with a headboard, and you fell flat, and then up you come, all reeling and staggering like, and snatched the knife and jammed it into him, just as he fetched you another awful clip, and here you've laid as dead as a wedge till now. Oh, I didn't know what I was a-doing. I wish I may die this minute if I did. It was all on account of the whiskey and the excitement, I reckon. I never used a weepon in my life before, Joe. I've fought, but never with weepons. They'll all say that. Joe, don't tell. Say you won't tell Joe. That's a good feller. I always liked you, Joe, and stood up for you, too. Don't you remember? You won't tell, will you, Joe? And the poor creature dropped on his knees before the stolid murderer and clasped his appealing hands. No, you've always been fair and square with me, Muff Potter, and I won't go back on you. There now that's as fair as a man can say. Oh, Joe, you're an angel. I'll bless you for this the longest day I live. And Potter began to cry. Come, now that's enough of that. This ain't any time for blubbering. You be off yonder way, and I'll go this. Move now, and don't leave any tracks behind you. Potter started on a trot that quickly increased to a run. The half-breed stood looking after him. He muttered, If he's as much stunned with the lick and fuddled with the rum as he had the look of being, he won't think of the knife till he's gone so far he'll be afraid to come back after it to such a place by himself, chicken heart. Two or three minutes later, the murdered man, the blanketed corpse, the lidless coffin, and the open grave were under no inspection but the moons. The stillness was complete again, too. Chapter 10 the two boys flew on and on, toward the village, speechless with horror. They glanced backward over their shoulders from time to time, apprehensively, as if they feared they might be followed. Every stump that started up in her path seemed a man and an enemy, and made them catch their breath. And as they sped by some outlying cottages that lay near the village, the barking of the aroused watchdogs seemed to give wings to their feet. If we can only get to the old tannery before we break down, whispered Tom in short catches between breaths. I can't stand it much longer. Huckleberry's hard pantings were his only reply, and the boys fixed their eyes on the goal of their hopes and bent to their work to win it. They gained steadily on it, and at last, breast to breast, they burst through the open door and fell grateful and exhausted in the sheltering shadows beyond. By and by their pulses slowed down, and Tom whispered, Huckleberry, what do you reckon will come of this? If Dr. Robinson dies, I reckon Hanging will come of it. Do you, though? Why? I know a Tom. Tom thought a while, then he said, Who'll tell? We? What are you talking about? Suppose something happened and Injun Joe didn't hang. Why, he'd kill us some time or other, just as dead sure as we're a-laying here. That's just what I was thinking to myself, Huck. If anybody tells, let Muff Potter do it, if he's fool enough, he's generally drunk enough. Tom said nothing when I'm thinking. Presently he whispered, Huck, Muff Potter don't know it. How can he tell? What's the reason you don't know it? Because he just got that whack when Injun Joe done it. Do you reckon he could see anything? Do you reckon he know anything? By hokey, that's so, Tom. And besides, look a here. Maybe that whack done for him. No, taint likely, Tom. 
He had liquor in him. I could see that, and besides, he always has. Well, when Pap's full, you might take and belt him over the head with a church, and you couldn't phase him. He says so his own self. So it's the same with Muff Potter, of course. But if a man was dead sober, I reckon maybe that whack might fetch him, I don't know. After another reflective silence, Tom said, Hucky, you sure you can keep mum? Tom, we got to keep mum. You know that. That injured devil would make any more of drowning us than a couple of cats if it was to squeak about this and they didn't hang him. Now look a here, Tom, let's take and swear to one another. That's what we got to do, swear to keep mum. I'm agreed. It's the best thing. Would you just hold hands and swear that we... Oh no, that wouldn't do for this. That's good enough for little rubbishy common things, especially with gals, cause they go back on you anyway and blab if they get in a huff, but their order be writing about a big thing like this. And blood. Tom's whole being applauded this idea. It was deep and dark and awful. The hour, the circumstances, the surroundings were in keeping with it. He picked up a clean pine shingle that lay in the moonlight, took a little fragment of red keel out of his pocket, got the moon on his work, and painfully scrawled these lines, emphasizing each slow down stroke by clamping his tongue between his teeth and letting up the pressure on the upstrokes. Huck Finn and Tom Sawyer swear as they will keep mum about this, and they wish they may drop down dead in their tracks if they ever tell and rot. Huckleberry was filled with admiration of Tom's facility in writing and the sublimity of his language. He at once took a pin from his lapel and was going to prick his flesh, but Tom said, Hold on. Don't do that. A pin's brass. It might have verdigris on it. What's verdigris? It's pizen. That's what it is. You just swallow some of it once. You'll see. So Tom unwound the thread from one of his needles and each boy pricked the ball of his thumb and squeezed out a drop of blood. In time, after many squeezes, Tom managed to sign his initials using the ball of his little finger for a pen. Then he showed Huckleberry how to make an A and an F, and the oath was complete. They buried the shingle close to the wall with some dismal ceremonies and incantations, and the fetters that bound their tongues were considered to be locked and the key thrown away. The figure crept stealthily through a break in the other end of the ruined building now, but they did not notice it. Tom whispered Huckleberry, does this keep us from ever telling, always? Of course it does. It don't make any difference what happens. We got to keep mum. We drop down dead, don't you know that? Yes, I reckon that's so. They continued to whisper for some little time. Presently, a dog set up a long, lugubrious howl just outside within ten feet of them. The boys clasped each other suddenly, in an agony of fright. Which of us does he mean? gasped Huckleberry. I don't know. Pete through the crack. Quick. No, you, Tom. I can't. I can't do it. Huck. Please, Tom. There tis again. Oh, lordy, I'm thankful, whispered Tom. I know his voice. It's Bull Harbison. Asterisk. Asterisk, if Mr. Harbison owned a slave named Bull, Tom would have spoken of him as Harbison's Bull, but a son or a dog of that name was Bull Harbison. Oh, that's good. I tell you, Tom, I was most scared to death. I'd have bet anything it was a stray dog. The dog howled again. The boy's hearts sank once more. Oh my, that ain't no Bull Harbison, whispered Huckleberry. Do, Tom. Tom, quaking with fear, yielded and put his eye to the crack. His whisper was hardly audible when he said, Oh, Huck, it's a stray dog. Quick, Tom, quick. Who does he mean? Huck, he must mean us both. We're right together. Oh, Tom, I reckon we're goners. I reckon there ain't no mistake about where I'll go to. I've been so wicked. Dad, fetch it. This comes of playing hooky and doing everything a feller's told not to do. I might have been good like Sid if I'd have tried, but no, I wouldn't, of course. But if ever I get off this time, I lay I'll just waller in Sunday schools, and Tom began to snuffle a little. You bad, and Huckleberry began to snuffle too. Consound it, Tom Sawyer, you're just old pie, long side of what I am. Oh, lordy, 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 I wish I only had half your chance. Tom choked off and whispered, Look, Hucky, look. He's got his back to us. Hucky looked, with joy in his heart. What he has by jingoes, did he before? Yes, he did, but I, like a fool, never thought, Oh, this is bully, you know. Now who can he mean? The howling stopped. Tom pricked up his ears. Shh. What's that? He whispered. Sounds like like hogs grunting. No, it's somebody snoring, Tom. That is it. Or bouts, is it? Huck. I believe it's down at t'other end. Sounds so anyway. Pap used to sleep there, sometimes, along with the hogs, but laws bless you. He just lifts things when he snores. Besides, I reckon he ain't ever coming back to this town anymore. The spirit of adventure rose in the boys' souls once more. Hucky. Do you dast to go if I lead? 
I don't like too much. Tom, suppose it's Injun Joe. Tom quailed, but presently the temptation rose up strong again and the boys agreed to try with the understanding that they would take to their heels if the snoring stopped. So they went tiptoeing stealthily down the one behind the other. When they had got to within five steps of the snorer, Tom stepped on a stick and it broke with a sharp snap. The man moaned, writhed a little, and his face came into the moonlight. It was Muff Potter. The boys' hearts had stood still and their hopes too when the man moved, but their fears passed away now. They tiptoed out through the broken weatherboarding and stopped at a little distance to exchange a parting word. That long, lugubrious howl rose on the night air again. They turned and saw the strange dog standing within a few feet of where Potter was lying and facing Potter with his nose pointing heavenward. Oh, Kimini, it's him, exclaimed both boys in a breath. Say, Tom, they say a stray dog come howling around Johnny Miller's house about midnight as much as two weeks ago and a whip-poor will come in and lit on the banisters and sung the very same evening, and there ain't anybody dead there yet. Well, I know that, and suppose there ain't. Didn't Gracie Miller fall in the kitchen fire and burn herself terrible the very next Saturday? Yes, but she ain't dead, and what's more, she's getting better too. All right, you wait and see. She's a gunner, just as dead sure as Muff Potter's a gunner. That's what the niggers say, and they know all about these kind of things, Huck. Then they separated, cogitating. When Tom crept in and his bedroom window of the night was almost spent, he undressed with excessive caution and fell asleep congratulating himself that nobody knew of his escapade. He was not aware that the gently snoring Sid was awake and had been so for an hour. When Tom awoke, Sid was dressed and gone. There was a late look in the light, a late sense in the atmosphere. He was startled. Why had he not been cowed, persecuted till he was up as usual? The thought filled him with bodings. Within five minutes, he was dressed and downstairs, feeling sore and drowsy. The family were still at table, but they had finished breakfast. There was no voice of rebuke, but there were averted eyes. There was a silence and an air of solemnity that struck a chill to the culprit's heart. He sat down and tried to seem gay, but it was uphill work. It roused no smile, no response, and he lapsed into silence and let his heart sink down to the depths. After breakfast, his aunt took him aside, and Tom almost brightened in the hope that he was going to be flogged, but it was not so. His aunt wept over him and asked him how he could go and break her old heart so, and finally told him to go on and ruin himself and bring her gray hairs with sorrow to the grave, for it was no use for her to try any more. This was worse than a thousand whippings, and Tom's heart was sorer now than his body. He cried, he pleaded for forgiveness, promised to reform over and over again, and then received his dismissal feeling that he had won but an imperfect forgiveness and established but a feeble confidence. He left the presence too miserable to even feel revengeful towards Sid, and so the latter's prompt retreat through the back gate was unnecessary. He moped to school gloomy and sad and took his flogging, along with Joe Harper, for playing hooky the day before, with the air of one whose heart was busy with heavier woes and wholly dead to trifles. Then he betook himself to his seat, rested his elbows on his desk and his jaws in his hands, and stared at the wall with a stony stare of suffering that has reached the limit and can no further go. His elbow was pressing against some hard substance. After a long time, he slowly and sadly changed his position and took up this object with a sigh. It was in a paper. He unrolled it. A long, lingering, colossal sigh followed and his heart broke. It was his brass and iron knob. His final feather broke the camel's back. Chapter 11 Close upon the hour of noon, the whole village was suddenly electrified of the ghastly news. No need of the as yet undreamed of telegraph. The tale flew from man to man, from group to group, from house to house, with little less than telegraphic speed. Of course the schoolmaster gave holiday for that afternoon. The town would have thought strangely of him if he had not. A gory knife had been found close to the murdered man, and it had been recognized by somebody as belonging to Muff Potter, so the story ran. And it was said that a belated citizen had come upon Potter washing himself in the branch about one or two o'clock in the morning, and that Potter had at once sneaked off suspicious circumstances, especially the washing which was not a habit with Potter. It was also said that the town had been ransacked for this murderer, the public are not slow in the matter of sifting evidence and arriving at a verdict, but that he could not be found. Horsemen had departed down all the roads in every direction, and the sheriff was confident that he would be captured before night. All the town was drifting toward the graveyard. Tom's heartbreak vanished and he joined the procession, not because he would not a thousand times rather go anywhere else, but because an awful, unaccountable fascination drew him on. Arrived at the dreadful place, he warmed his small body through the crowd and saw the dismal spectacle. It seemed to him an age since he was there before. Somebody pinched his arm. He turned and his eyes met Huckleberry's. Then both looked elsewhere at once and wondered if anybody had noticed anything in their mutual glance. 
but everybody was talking and intent upon the grisly spectacle before them. Poor fellow, poor young fellow. This ought to be a lesson to grave robbers. Muff Potter will hang for this if they catch him. This was the drift of remark, and the minister said it was a judgment, his hand is here. Now Tom shivered from head to heel, for his eye fell upon the stolid face of Injun Joe. At this moment the crowd began to sway and struggle, and voices shouted, It's him. It's him. He's coming himself. Who? Who? From twenty voices. Muff Potter. Hallo. He's stopped. Look out, he's turning. Don't let him get away. People in the branches of the trees over Tom's head said he wasn't trying to get away. He only looked doubtful and perplexed. Infernal impudence, said a bystander. Wanted to come and take a quiet look at his work, I reckon, didn't expect any company. The crowd fell apart now and the sheriff came through, ostentatiously leading Potter by the arm. The poor fellow's face was haggard, and his eyes showed the fear that was upon him. When he stood before the murdered man, he shook as with a palsy, and he put his face in his hands and burst into tears. I didn't do it, friends, he sobbed. Pawn my word and honor, I never done it. Who's accused you? shouted a voice. This shot seemed to carry home. Potter lifted his face and looked around him with a pathetic hopelessness in his eyes. He saw Injun Joe and exclaimed, Oh, Injun Joe, you promised me you'd never. Is that your knife? And it was thrust before him by the sheriff. Potter would have fallen if they had not caught him and eased him to the ground. Then he said, Something told me to if I didn't come back and get, he shuddered, then waved his nerveless hand with a vanquished gesture and said, Tell him, Joe. Tell him. It ain't any use anymore. Then Huckleberry and Tom stood dumb and staring and heard the stony-hearted liar reel off his serene statement, they expecting every moment that the clear sky would deliver God's lightnings upon his head, and wondering to see how long the stroke was delayed. And when he had finished and still stood alive and whole, their wavering impulse to break their oath and save the poor betrayed prisoner's life faded and vanished away, for plainly this miscreant had sold himself to Satan, and it would be fatal to meddle with the property of such a power as that. Why didn't you leave? What did you want to come here for? Somebody said. I couldn't help it. I couldn't help it, Potter moaned. I wanted to run away, but I couldn't seem to come anywhere but here, and he fell to sobbing again. Injun Joe repeated his statement just as calmly a few minutes after we were on the inquest under oath and the boys, seeing that the lightnings were still withheld, were confirmed in their belief that Joe had sold himself to the devil. He was now become, to them, the most balefully interesting object they had ever looked upon, and they could not take their fascinated eyes from his face. They inwardly resolved to watch him nights when opportunity should offer in the hope of getting a glimpse of his dread master. Injun Joe helped to raise the body of the murdered man and put it in a wagon for removal, and it was whispered through the shuddering crowd that the wound bled a little. The boys thought that this happy circumstance would turn suspicion in the right direction, but they were disappointed, for more than one villager remarked. It was within three feet of Muff Potter when it done it. Tom's fearful secret and gnawing conscience disturbed his sleep for as much as a week after this, and at breakfast one morning Sid said, Tom, you pitch around and talk in your sleep so much that you keep me awake half the time. Tom blanched and dropped his eyes. It's a bad sign, said Aunt Polly gravely. What you got on your mind, Tom? Nothing. Nothing that I know of. But the boy's hand shook so that he spilled his coffee. And you do talk such stuffs, Sid said. Last night you said, it's blood, it's blood, that's what it is. You said that over and over. And you said, don't torment me so. I'll tell. Tell what? What is it you'll tell? Everything was swimming before Tom. There is no telling what might have happened now, but luckily the concern passed out of Aunt Polly's face, and she came to Tom's relief without knowing it, she said. Show. It's that dreadful murder. I dream about it most every night myself. Sometimes I dream it's me that done it. Mary said she had been affected much the same way. Sid seemed satisfied. Tom got out of the presence as quick as he plausibly could, and after that he complained of toothache for a week and tied up his jaws every night. He never knew that Sid lay mightily watching and frequently slipped the bandage free and then leaned on his elbow listening a good while at a time, and afterwards slipped the bandage back to its place again. Tom's distress of mind wore off gradually and the toothache grew irksome and was discarded. If Sid really managed to make anything out of Tom's disjointed mutterings, he kept it to himself. It seemed to Tom that his schoolmates never would get done holding inquests on dead cats, and thus keeping his trouble present to his mind. Sid noticed that Tom never was coroner at one of these inquiries, though it had been his habit to take the lead in all new enterprises. He noticed, too, that Tom never acted as a witness, and that was strange. And Sid did not overlook the fact that Tom even showed a marked aversion to these inquests and always avoided them when he could. Sid marveled, but said nothing. However, even inquests went out of vogue at last, 
and ceased to torture Tom's conscience. Every day or two, during this time of sorrow, Tom watched his opportunity and went to the little grated jail window and smuggled such small comforts through to the murderer as he could get hold of. The jail was a trifling little brick den that stood in a marsh at the edge of the village and no guards were afforded for it. Indeed, it was seldom occupied. These offerings greatly helped to ease Tom's conscience. The villagers had a strong desire to tar and feather Injun Joe and ride him on a rail, for body snatching, but so formidable was his character that nobody could be found who was willing to take the lead in the matter, so it was dropped. He had been careful to begin both of his inquest statements with the fight without confessing the grave robbery that preceded it. Therefore, it was deemed wisest not to try the case in the courts at present. Chapter 12 One of the reasons why Tom's mind had drifted away from its secret troubles was that it had found a new and weighty matter to interest itself about. Becky Thatcher had stopped coming to school. Tom had struggled with his pride a few days and tried to whistle her down the wind, but failed. He began to find himself hanging around her father's house nights and feeling very miserable. She was ill. What if she should die? There was distraction in the thought. He no longer took an interest in war, nor even in piracy. The charm of life was gone. There was nothing but dreariness left. He put his hoop away in his bat. There was no joy in them anymore. His aunt was concerned. She began to try all manner of remedies on him. She was one of those people who are infatuated with patent medicines and all newfangled methods of producing health or mending it. She was an inveterate experimenter in these things. When something fresh in this line came out, she was in a fever, right away, to try it. Not on herself, for she was never ailing, but on anybody else that came handy. She was a subscriber for all the health periodicals and phrenological frauds, and the solemn ignorance they were inflated with was breath to her nostrils. All the rot they contained about ventilation and how to go to bed, and how to get up, and what to eat, and what to drink, and how much exercise to take, and what frame of mind to keep oneself in, and what sort of clothing to wear, was all gospel to her, and she never observed that her health journals of the current month customarily upset everything they had recommended the month before. She was as simple-hearted and honest as the day was long, and so she was an easy victim. She gathered together her quack periodicals and her quack medicines, and thus armed with death, went about on her pale horse, metaphorically speaking, with hell following after. But she never suspected that she was not an angel of healing in the balm of Gilead in disguise to the suffering neighbors. The water treatment was new now, and Tom's low condition was a windfall to her. She had him out at daylight every morning, stood him up in the woodshed, and drowned him with a deluge of cold water. Then she scrubbed him down with a towel like a file, and so brought him to. Then she rolled him up in a wet sheet, and put him away under blankets till she sweated his soul clean, and the yellow stains of it came through his pores, as Tom said. Yet notwithstanding all this, the boy grew more and more melancholy and pale and dejected. She added hot baths, sits baths, shower baths, and plunges. The boy remained as dismal as a hearse. She began to assist the water with a slim oatmeal diet and blister plasters. She calculated his capacity as she would a jugs and filled him up every day with quack cure-alls. Tom had become indifferent to persecution by this time. This phase filled the old lady's heart with consternation. This indifference must be broken up at any cost. Now she heard of painkiller for the first time. She ordered a lot at once. She tasted it and was filled with gratitude. It was simply fire in a liquid form. She dropped the water treatment and everything else and pinned her faith to painkiller. She gave Tom a teaspoonful and watched with the deepest anxiety for the result. Her troubles were instantly at rest, her soul at peace again, for the indifference was broken up. The boy could not have shown a wilder, heartier interest if she had built a fire under him. Tom felt that it was time to wake up. This sort of life might be romantic enough in his blighted condition, but it was getting to have too little sentiment and too much distracting variety about it. So he thought over various plans for relief and finally hit upon that of professing to be fond of painkiller. He asked for it so often that he became a nuisance and his aunt ended by telling him to help himself and quit bothering her. If it had been Sid, she would have had no misgivings to alloy her delight. But since it was Tom, she watched the bottle clandestinely. She found that the medicine did really diminish, but it did not occur to her that the boy was mending the health of a crack in the sitting room floor with it. One day Tom was in the act of dosing the crack when his aunt's yellow cat came along, purring, eyeing the teaspoon avariciously, and begging for a taste. Tom said, Don't ask for it unless you want it, Peter. But Peter signified that he did want it. You better make sure. Peter was sure. Now you've asked for it and I'll give it to you, because there ain't anything mean about me, but if you find you don't like it, you mustn't blame anybody but your own self. Peter was agreeable, so Tom pried his mouth open and poured down the painkiller. Peter sprang a couple of yards in the air, and then delivered a war whoop and set off round and round the room, banging against furniture, upsetting flower pots, and making general havoc. 
Next, he rose on his hind feet and pranced around in a frenzy of enjoyment, with his head over his shoulder and his voice proclaiming his unappeasable happiness. Then he went tearing around the house again, spreading chaos and destruction in his path. Aunt Polly entered in time to see him throw a few double somersets, deliver a final mighty hurrah, and sail through the open window, carrying the rest of the flower pots with him. The old lady stood petrified with astonishment, peering over her glasses. Tom lay on the floor, expiring with laughter. Tom, what on earth ails that cat? I don't know, aunt, gasped the boy. Why, I never see anything like it. What did make him act so? Deed, I don't know, Aunt Polly. Cats always act so when they're having a good time. They give you, they. There was something in the tone that made Tom apprehensive. Yes, am That is, I believe they do. You do? Yes, am The old lady was bending down, Tom watching with interest emphasized by anxiety. Too late, he divined her drift. The handle of the telltale teaspoon was visible under the bed valance. Aunt Polly took it, held it up. Tom winced and dropped his eyes. Aunt Polly raised him by the usual handle, his ear, and cracked his head soundly with her thimble. Now, sir, what did you want to treat that poor dumb beast so for? I'd done it out of pity for him, because he hadn't any aunt. Hadn't any aunt? You numbskull. What has that got to do with it? Heaps. Because if he'd had one, she'd have burnt him out herself. She'd have roasted his bowels out of him without any more feeling than if he was a human. Aunt Polly felt a sudden pang of remorse. This was putting the thing in a new light. What was cruelty to a cat might be cruelty to a boy, too. She began to soften. She felt sorry. Her eyes watered a little, and she put her hand on Tom's head and said gently, I was mean for the best, Tom, and Tom, it did do you good. Tom looked up in her face with just a perceptible twinkle peeping through his gravity. I know you was meaning for the best, auntie, and so was I with Peter. It done him good, too. I never see him get around so since. Oh, go along with you, Tom, before you aggravate me again. And you try and see if you can't be a good boy for once, and you needn't take any more medicine. Tom reached school ahead of time. It was noticed that this strange thing had been occurring every day latterly. And now, as usual of late, he hung about the gate of the schoolier instead of playing with his comrades. He was sick, he said, and he looked it. He tried to seem to be looking everywhere, but whither he really was looking, down the road. Presently, Jeff Thatcher hove in sight, and Tom's face lighted. He gazed a moment, and then turned sorrowfully away. When Jeff arrived, Tom accosted him and led up wearily to opportunities for a remark about Becky, but the giddy lad never could see the bait. Tom watched and watched, hoping whenever a frisking frock came in sight and hating the owner of it, as soon as he saw she was not the right one. At last, frocks ceased to appear, and he dropped hopelessly into the dumps, he entered the empty schoolhouse and sat down to suffer. Then one more frock passed in at the gate, and Tom's heart gave a great bound. The next instant he was out and going on like an Indian, yelling, laughing, chasing boys, jumping over the fence at risk of life and limb, throwing handsprings, standing on his head, doing all the heroic things he could conceive of and keeping a furtive eye out all the while to see if Becky Thatcher was noticing. But she seemed to be unconscious of it all. She never looked. Could it be possible that she was not aware that he was there? He carried his exploits to her immediate vicinity, came war whooping around, snatched a boy's cap, hurled it to the roof of the schoolhouse, broke through a group of boys, tumbling them in every direction, and fell sprawling himself under Becky's nose, almost upsetting her. And she turned, with her nose in the air, and he heard her say, Meph, some people think they're mighty smart, always showing off. Tom's cheeks burned. He gathered himself up and sneaked off, crushed and crestfallen. Chapter 13 Tom's mind was made up now. He was gloomy and desperate. He was a forsaken, friendless boy, he said. Nobody loved him. When they found out what they had driven him to, perhaps they would be sorry. He tried to do right and get along, but they would not let him. Since nothing would do them but to be rid of him, let it be so. And let them blame him for the consequences. Why shouldn't they? What right had the friendless to complain? Yes, they had forced him to it at last. He would lead a life of crime. There was no choice. By this time, he was far down Meadow Lane, and the bell for school to take up tinkled faintly upon his ear. He sobbed now to think he should never, never hear that old familiar sound anymore. It was very hard, but it was forced on him. Since he was driven out into the cold world, he must submit, but he forgave them. Then the sobs came thick and fast. Just at this point, he met his soul's sworn comrade, Joe Harper, hard-eyed and with evidently a great and dismal purpose in his heart. Plainly here were two souls with but a single thought. Tom, wiping his eyes with his sleeve, began to blubber out something about a resolution to escape from hard usage and lack of sympathy at home by roaming abroad into the great world never to return, and ended by hoping that Joe would not forget him. 
but it transpired that this was a request which Joe had just been going to make of Tom and had come to hunt him up for that purpose. His mother had whipped him for drinking some cream which he had never tasted and knew nothing about. It was plain that she was tired of him and wished him to go. If she felt that way, there was nothing for him to do but succumb. He hoped she would be happy and never regret having driven her poor boy out into the unfeeling world to suffer and die. As the two boys walked sorrowing along, they made a new compact to stand by each other and be brothers and never separate till death relieved them of their troubles. Then they began to lay their plans. Joe was for being a hermit and living on crusts in a remote cave and dying some time of cold and want and grief. But after listening to Tom, he conceded that there were some conspicuous advantages about a life of crime, and so he consented to be a pirate. Three miles below Street Petersburg, at a point where the Mississippi River was a trifle over a mile wide, there was a long, narrow, wooded island with a shallow bar at the head of it, and this offered well as a rendezvous. It was not inhabited. It lay far over toward the further shore, abreast a dense and almost wholly unpeopled forest. So Jackson's island was chosen. Who were to be the subjects of their piracies was a matter that did not occur to them. Then they hunted up Huckleberry Finn, and he joined them promptly, for all careers were one to him. He was indifferent. They presently separated to meet at a lonely spot on the river bank two miles above the village at the favor hour, which was midnight. There was a small log raft there which they meant to capture. Each would bring hooks and lines and such provision as he could steal in the most dark and mysterious manage to enjoy the sweet glory of spreading the fact that pretty soon the town would hear something. All who got this vague hint were cautioned to be mum and wait. About midnight Tom arrived with a boiled ham and a few trifles, and stopped in a dense undergrove on a small bluff overlooking the meeting place. It was starlight and very still. The mighty river lay like an ocean at rest. Tom listened a moment, but no sound disturbed the quiet. Then he gave a low, distinct whistle. It was answered from under the bluff. Tom whistled twice more. These signals were answered in the same way. Then a guarded voice said, Who goes there? Tom Sawyer, a black avenger of the Spanish main. Name your names. Huck Finn, the red-handed, and Joe Harper, the terror of the seas. Tom had furnished these titles from his favorite literature. Tis well, keep the countersign. Two hoarse whispers delivered the same awful words simultaneously to the brooding night. Blood. Then Tom tumbled his ham over the bluff and let himself down after it, tearing both skin and clothes to some extent in the effort. There was an easy, comfortable path along the shore under the bluff, but it lacked the advantages of difficulty and danger so valued by a pirate. The terror of the seas had brought a side of bacon and had about worn himself out with getting it there. Finn the red-handed had stolen a skillet and a quantity of half-cured leaf tobacco and had also brought a few corn cobs to make pipes with, but none of the pirates smoked or chewed but himself. The black avenger of the Spanish mains said it would never do to start without some fire. That was a wise thought. Matches were hardly known there in that day. They saw a fire smoldering upon a great raft a hundred yards above, and they went stealthily thither and helped themselves to a chunk. They made an imposing adventure of it, saying, Hist, every now and then, and suddenly halting with finger on lip, moving with hands on imaginary dagger hilts, and giving orders in dismal whispers that if the foe stirred, to let him have it to the hilt, because dead men tell no tales. They knew well enough that the raftsmen were all down at the village laying in stores or having a spree, but still that was no excuse for their conducting this thing in an unpiratical way. They shoved off presently, Tom in command, Huck at the after oar, and Joe at the forward. Tom stood amidships, gloomy browed and the folded arms, and gave his orders in a low, stern whisper. Luff and bring her to the wind. Ay, sir. Steady, steady I, ay. Steady it is, sir. Let her go off a point. Point it is, sir. As the boys steadily and monotonously drove the raft toward midstream, it was no doubt understood that these orders were given only for style and were not intended to mean anything in particular. What sail is she carrying? Courses, topsails, and flying jibs, sir. Send the reels up, lay out aloft there, half a dozen of ye. Foretop Miss Stunzel. Lively now. Ay, sir. Shake out that main tobolinzel. Sheets and braces. Now my hearties. Ay, sir. Helen Lee. Hard a port. Stand by to meet her when she comes. Port, port. Now, men, with a will, stead, magay. Steady it is, sir. The raft drew beyond the middle of the river. The boys pointed her head right and then lay on their oars. The river was not high, so there was not more than a two or three mile current. Hardly a word was said during the next three quarters of an hour. Now the raft was passing before the distant town. Two or three glimmering lights showed where it lay, peacefully sleeping beyond the vague, vast sweep of star gemmed water unconscious of the tremendous event that was happening. 
The Black Avenger stood still with folded arms, looking his last upon the scene of his former joys and his later sufferings, and wishing she could see him now, abroad on the wild sea, facing peril and death with dauntless heart, going to his doom with a grim smile on his lips. It was but a small strain on his imagination to remove Jackson's island beyond eyeshot of the village, and so he looked his last with a broken and satisfied heart. The other pirates were looking their last, too, and they all looked so long that they came near letting the current drift them out of the range of the island. But they discovered the danger in time and made shift to avert it. About two o'clock in the morning the raft grounded on the bar two hundred yards above the head of the island, and they waded back and forth until they had landed their freight. Part of the little raft's belongings consisted of an old sail, and this they spread over a nook in the bushes for a tent to shelter their provisions. But they themselves would sleep in the open air in good weather, as became outlaws. They built a fire against the side of a great log twenty or thirty steps within the somber depths of the forest, and then cooked some bacon in the frying pan for supper, and used up half of the corn pone stock they had brought. It seemed glorious sport to be feasting in that wild freeway in the virgin forest of an unexplored and uninhabited island, far from the haunts of men, and they said they never would return to civilization. The climbing fire lit up their faces and threw its ruddy glare upon the pillared tree trunks of their forest temple and upon the varnished foliage and festooning vines. When the last crisp slice of bacon was gone and the last allowance of corn pone devoured, the boys stretched themselves out on the grass, filled with contentment. They could have found a cooler place, but they would not deny themselves such a romantic feature as the roasting campfire. Ain't it gay, said Joe. It's nuts, said Tom. What would the boys say if they could see us? Say? Well, then just die to be here. Heck, Hucky. I reckon so, said Huckleberry. Anyways, I'm suited. I don't want nothing better than this. I don't ever get enough to eat, generally, and here they can't come and pick at a feller and bully wreck him so. It's just the life for me, said Tom. You don't have to get up mornings and you don't have to go to school and wash and all that blame foolishness. You see, a pirate don't have to do anything, Joe, when he's ashore, but a hermit he has to be praying considerable, and then he don't have any fun, anyway, all by himself that way. Oh, yes, that's so, said Joe, but I hadn't thought much about it, you know. I'd a good deal rather be a pirate, now that I've tried it. You see, said Tom, people don't go much on hermits nowadays like they used to in old times, but a pirate's always respected. And a hermit's got to sleep on the hardest place he can find and put sackcloth and ashes on his head and stand out in the rain and... What does he put sackcloth and ashes on his head for? inquired Huck. I don't know, but they've got to do it. Hermits always do. You'd have to do that, if he was a hermit. Certain if I would, said Huck. Well, what would you do? I don't know, but I wouldn't do that. Why, uh, you'd have to. How'd you get around it? Why, I just wouldn't stand it. I'd run away. Run away? Well, you'd be a nice old slotch of a hermit. You'd be a disgrace. The red-handed made no response, being better employed. He had finished gouging on a cob, and now he fitted a weed stem to it, loaded it with tobacco, and was pressing a coal to the charge and blowing a cloud of fragrant smoke. He was in the full bloom of luxurious contentment. The other pirates invite him this majestic vice and secretly resolve to acquire it shortly. Presently Huck said, What does pirates have to do? Tom said, Oh, they have just a bully time. Take ships and burn them, and get the money and bury it in awful places in their island where there's ghosts and things to watch it and kill everybody in the ships, make him walk a plank. And they carry the women to the island, said Joe. They don't kill the women. No, assented Tom. They don't kill the women. They're too noble. And the women's always beautiful, too. And don't they wear the bulliest clothes? Oh, no. All gold and silver and diamonds, said Joe with enthusiasm. Who, said Huck. Why, the pirates? Huck scanned his own clothing forlornly. I reckon I ain't dressed fitting for a pirate, said he with a regretful pathos in his voice. But I ain't got none but these. But the other boys told him the fine clothes would come fast enough after they should have begun their adventures. They made him understand that his poor rags would do to begin with, though it was customary for wealthy pirates to start with a proper wardrobe. Gradually their talk died out and drowsiness began to steal upon the eyelids of the little waifs. The pike dropped from the fingers of the red-handed and he slept the sleep of the conscience-free and the weary. The terror of the seas and the black avenger of the Spanish main had more difficulty in getting to sleep. They said their prayers inwardly and lying down since there was nobody there with authority to make them kneel and recite aloud. In truth, they had a mind not to say them at all, but they were afraid to proceed to such lengths as that lest they might call down a sudden and special thunderbolt from heaven. Then at once they reached and hovered upon the imminent verge of sleep, but an intruder came now that would not down. It was conscience. They began to feel a vague fear that they had been doing wrong to run away. 
and next they thought of the stolen meat, and then the real torture came. They tried to argue it away by reminding Conscience that they had purloined sweetmeats and apples scores of times, but Conscience was not to be appeased by such thin plausibilities. It seemed to them, in the end, that there was no getting around the stubborn fact that taking sweetmeats was only cooking, while taking bacon and hams and such valuables was plain simple stealing, and there was a command against that in the Bible. So they inwardly resolved that so long as they remained in the business, their piracies should not again be sullied with the crime of stealing. Then conscience granted a truce, and these curiously inconsistent pirates fell peacefully to sleep. Chapter 14. When Tom awoke in the morning, he wondered where he was. He sat up and rubbed his eyes and looked around. Then he comprehended. It was the cool gray dawn, and there was a delicious sense of repose and peace in the deep pervading calm and silence of the woods. Not a leaf stirred, not a sound obtruded upon great nature's meditation. Beaded dewdrops stood upon the leaves and grasses. A white layer of ashes covered the fire and a thin blue breath of smoke rose straight into the air. Joe and Huck still slept. Now far away in the woods a bird called. Another answered. Presently the hammering of the woodpecker was heard. Gradually the cool dim gray of the morning whitened, and as gradually sounds multiplied and life manifested itself. The marvel of nature shaking off sleep and going to work unfolded itself to the musing boy. A little green worm came crawling over a dewy leaf, lifting two-thirds of his body into the air from time to time and sniffing around, then proceeding again. For he was measuring, Tom said, and when the worm approached him, of his own accord he sat as still as a stone, with his hopes rising and falling by turns as the creature still came toward him or seemed inclined to go elsewhere. And when at last it considered a painful moment with its curved body in the air, and then came decisively down upon Tom's leg and began a journey over him, his whole heart was glad, for that meant that he was going to have a new suit of clothes, without the shadow of a doubt a gaudy piratical uniform. Now a procession of ants appeared, from nowhere in particular, and went about their labors. One struggled manfully by with a dead spider five times as big as itself in its arms and lugged it straight up a tree trunk. A brown-spotted ladybug climbed the dizzy height on the grass blade, and Tom bent down close to it and said, Ladybug, ladybug, fly away home, your house is on fire, your children's alone, and she took wing and went off to see about it. Which did not surprise the boy, for he knew of old that this insect was credulous about conflagrations, and he had practiced upon its simplicity more than once. A tumblebug came next, heaving sturdily at its ball, and Tom touched the creature to see it shut its legs against its body and pretend to be dead. The birds were fairly rioting by this time. A catbird, the northern mocker, lit in a tree over Tom's head and trilled out her imitations of her neighbors in a rapture of enjoyment. Then a shrill jay swept down, a flash of blue flame, and stopped on a twig almost within the boy's reach, hocked his head to one side, and eyed the strangers with a consuming curiosity. A gray squirrel and a big fellow of the fox kind came scurrying along, sitting up at intervals to inspect and chatter at the boys. For the wild things had probably never seen a human being before and scarcely knew whether to be afraid or not. All nature was wide awake and stirring, now long lances of sunlight pierced down through the dense foliage far and near and a few butterflies came fluttering upon the scene. Tom stirred up the other pirates and they all clattered away with a shout and in a minute or two were stripped and chasing after and tumbling over each other in the shallow limpid water of the white sandbar. They felt no longing for the little village sleeping in the distance beyond the majestic waste of water. A vagrant current or a slight rise in the river had carried off their raft, but this only gratified them, since its going was something like burning the bridge between them and civilization. They came back to camp wonderfully refreshed, glad-hearted, and ravenous, and they soon had the campfire blazing up again. Huck found a spring of clear cold water close by and the boys made cups of broad oak or hickory leaves and felt that water, sweetened with such a wildwood charm as that, would be a good enough substitute for coffee. While Joe was slicing bacon for breakfast, Tom and Huck asked him to hold on a minute. They stepped to a promising nook in the riverbank and threw in their lines. Almost immediately had reward. Joe had not had time to get impatient before they were back again with some handsome bass, a couple of sun perch and a small catfish, provisions enough for quite a family. They fried the fish with the bacon and were astonished, for no fish had ever seemed so delicious before. They did not know that the quicker a freshwater fish is on the fire after he has caught the better he is, and they reflected little upon what a sauce open-air sleeping, open-air exercise, bathing, and a large ingredient of hunger make too. They lay around in the shade after breakfast, while Huck had a smoke, and then went off through the woods on an exploring expedition. They tramped gaily along over decaying logs through tangled underbrush among solemn monarchs of the forest, hung from their crowns to the ground with a drooping regalia of grapevines. Now and then they came upon snub nooks carpeted with grass and jeweled with flowers. 
They found plenty of things to be delighted with, but nothing to be astonished at. They discovered that the island was about three miles long and a quarter of a mile wide, and that the shore it lay closest to was only separated from it by a narrow channel hardly two hundred yards wide. They took a swim about every hour, so it was close upon the middle of the afternoon when they got back to camp. They were too hungry to stop to fish, but they fared sumptuously upon cold ham, and then threw themselves down in the shade to talk. But the talk soon began to drag and then died. The stillness, the solemnity that brooded in the woods and the sense of loneliness began to tell upon the spirits of the boys. They fell to thinking. A sort of undefined longing crept upon them. This took dim shape, presently it was budding homesickness. Even Finn the red-handed was dreaming of his doorsteps and empty hogsheads, but they were all ashamed of their weakness and none was brave enough to speak his thought. For some time now the boys had been dully conscious of a peculiar sound in the distance, just as one sometimes is of the ticking of a clock which he takes no distinct note of. But now this mysterious sound became more pronounced and forced a recognition. The boys started, glanced at each other, and then each assumed a listening attitude. There was a long silence, profound and unbroken, then a deep, sullen boom came floating down out of the distance. What is it? exclaimed Joe under his breath. I wonder, said Tom in a whisper. Tank thunder, said Huckleberry in an awed tone, because thunder. Hark, said Tom. Listen, don't talk. They waited a time that seemed an age, and then the same muffled boom troubled the solemn hush. Let's go and see. They sprang to their feet and hurried to the shore toward the town. They parted the bushes on the bank and peered out over the water. The little steam ferry boat was about a mile below the village, drifting with the current. Her broad deck seemed crowded with people. There were a great many skiffs rowing about or floating with the stream in the neighborhood of the ferry boat, but the boys could not determine what the men in them were doing. Presently a great jet of white smoke burst from the ferry boat's side, and as it expanded and rose in a lazy cloud, that same dull throb of sound was borne to the listeners again. I know now, exclaimed Tom. Somebody's drowned. That's it, said Huck. They'd done that last summer when Bill Turner got drowned. They shoot a cannon over the water, and that makes him come up to the top. Yes, and they take loaves of bread and put quicksilver in them and set them afloat, and wherever there's anybody that's drowned, they'll float right there and stop. Yes, I've heard about that, said Joe. I wonder what makes the bread do that. Oh, it ain't the bread. So much, said Tom. I reckon it's mostly what they say over it before they start it out. But they don't say anything over it, said Huck. I've seen them and they don't. Well, that's funny, said Tom. But maybe they say it to themselves. Of course they do. Anybody might know that. The other boys agreed that there was reason in what Tom said, because an ignorant lump of bread, uninstructed by an incantation, could not be expected to act very intelligently when set upon an errand of such gravity. By jings, I wish I was over there now, said Joe. I do too, said Huck. I'd give heaps to know who it is. The boys still listened and watched. Presently, a revealing thought flashed through Tom's mind, and he exclaimed, Boys, I know who's drowned. It's us. They felt like heroes in an instant. Here was a gorgeous triumph. They were missed. They were mourned. Hearts were breaking on their account. Tears were being shed. Accusing memories of unkindness to these poor lost lads were rising up, and unavailing regrets and remorse were being indulged, and best of all, the departed were the talk of the whole town and the envy of all the boys as far as this dazzling notoriety was concerned. This was fine. It was worthwhile to be a pirate, after all. As twilight drew on, the ferryboat went back to her accustomed business and the skiffs disappeared. The pirates returned to camp. They were jubilant with vanity over their new grandeur and the illustrious trouble they were making. They caught fish, cooked supper, and ate it, and then fell to guessing at what the village was thinking and saying about them. And the pictures they drew of the public distress on their account were gratifying to look upon, from their point of view. But when the shadows of night closed them in, they gradually ceased to talk and sat gazing into the fire, with their minds evidently wandering elsewhere. The excitement was gone now, and Tom and Joe could not keep back thoughts of certain persons at home who were not enjoying this fine frolic as much as they were. Misgivings came, they grew troubled and unhappy. A sigh or two escaped, unawares. By and by Joe timidly ventured upon a roundabout feeler as to how the others might look upon a return to civilization. Not right now, what Tom withered him with derision. Huck, being uncommitted as yet, joined in with Tom, and the waverer quickly explained, and was glad to get out of the scrape with as little taint of chicken-hearted homesickness clinging to his garments as he could. Mutiny was effectually laid to rest for the moment. As the night deepened, Huck began to nod and presently to snore. Joe followed next. Tom lay upon his elbow motionless for some time, watching the two intently. At last he got up cautiously on his knees and went searching among the grass and the flickering reflections flung by the campfire. 
He picked up and inspected several large semi-cylinders of the thin white bark of a sycamore and finally chose two which seemed to suit him. Then he knelt by the fire and painfully wrote something upon each of these with his red keel, one he rolled up and put in his jacket pocket and the other he put in Joe's hat and removed it to a little distance from the owner. And he also put into the hat certain schoolboy treasures of almost inestimable value. Among them a lump of chalk, an India rubber ball, three fish hooks, and one of that kind of marbles known as a sure enough crystal. Then he tiptoed his way cautiously among the trees till he felt that he was out of hearing and straightway broke into a keen run in the direction of the sandbar. Chapter 15 A few minutes later Tom was in the shoal water of the bar wading toward the Illinois shore. Before the depth reached his mill he was halfway over. The current would permit no more wading now so he struck out confidently to swim the remaining hundred yards. He swam quartering upstream, but still was swept downward rather faster than he had expected. However, he reached the shore finally and drifted along till he found a low place and drew himself out. He put his hand on his jacket pocket, found his piece of bark safe, and then struck through the woods following the shore with streaming garments. Shortly before ten o'clock he came out into an open place opposite the village and saw the ferryboat lying in the shadow of the trees and the high bank. Everything was quiet under the blinking stars. He crept down the bank watching with all his eyes, slipped into the water, swam three or four strokes and climbed into the skiff that did yawl duty at the boat's stern. He laid himself down under the forts and waited, panting. Presently the cracked bell tapped and a voice gave the order to cast off. A minute or two later the skiff's head was standing high up against the boat's swell and the voyage was begun. Tom felt happy in his success, for he knew it was the boat's last trip for the night. At the end of a long twelve or fifteen minutes the wheels stopped and Tom slipped overboard and swam ashore in the dusk, lightning fifty yards downstream out of danger of possible stragglers. He flew along unfrequented alleys and shortly found himself at his aunt's back fence. He climbed over, approached the L, and looked in at the sitting room window for a light was burning there. There sat Aunt Polly, Sid Mary, and Joe Harper's mother, grouped together, talking. They were by the bed, and the bed was between them and the door. Tom went to the door and began to softly lift the latch. Then he pressed gently and the door yielded a crack. He continued pushing cautiously and quaking every time it creaked, till he judged he might squeeze through on his knees. So he put his head through and began warily. What makes the candle blow so? said Aunt Polly. Tom hurried up. Why, that door's open. I believe. Why, of course it is. No end of strange things now. Go long and shut it, Sid. Tom disappeared under the bed just in time. He lay and breathed himself for a time, and then crept to where he could almost touch his aunt's foot. But as I was saying, said Aunt Polly, he weren't bad, so to say, only mischievous. Only just giddy and harum scarum, you know. He weren't any more responsible than a colt. He never meant any harm, and he was the best-hearted boy that ever was. And she began to cry. It was just so with my Joe, always full of his devilment and up to every kind of mischief, but he was just as unselfish and kind as he could be, and laws bless me. To think I went and whipped him for taking that cream, never once recollecting that I throwed it out myself because it was sour, and I never to see him again in this world, never, 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 poor abused boy. And Mrs. Harper sobbed as if her heart would break. I hope Tom's better off where he is, said Sid, but if he'd been better in some ways. Sid, Tom felt the glare of the old lady's eye, though he could not see it. Not a word against my Tom, now that he's gone. God will take care of him. Never you trouble yourself, sir. Oh, Mrs. Harper, I don't know how to give him up. I don't know how to give him up. He was such a comfort to me, although he tormented my old heart out of me. Most, the Lord giveth, and the Lord hath taken away. Lest be the name of the Lord. But it's so hard. Oh, it's so hard. Only last Saturday my Joe busted a firecracker right under my nose and I knocked him sprawling. Little did I know then, how soon, oh, if it was to do over again, I'd hug him and bless him for it. Yes, 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 I know just how you feel, Mrs. Harper. I know just exactly how you feel. No longer ago than yesterday noon, my Tom took and filled the cat full of painkiller, and I did think the creeter would tear the house down. And God forgive me, I cracked Tom's head with my thimble, poor boy, poor dead boy. But he's out of all his troubles now. And the last words I ever heard him say was to reproach. But this memory was too much for the old lady, and she broke entirely down. Tom was snuffling now himself, and more in pity of himself than anybody else. He could hear Mary crying and putting in a kindly word for him from time to time. He began to have a nobler opinion of himself than ever before. Still, he was sufficiently touched by his aunt's grief to long to rush out from under the bed and overwhelm her with joy, and the theatrical gorgeousness of the thing appealed strongly to his nature too, but he resisted and lay still. 
He went on listening and gathered by odds and ends that it was conjectured at first that the boys had got drowned while taking a swim, then the small raft had been missed. Next, certain boys say the missing lads had promised that the village should hear something soon. The wise heads had put this and that together and decided that the lads had gone off on that raft and would turn up the next town below presently. But toward noon, the raft had been found lodged against the Missouri shore some five or six miles below the village, and then hope perished. They must be drowned, else hunger would have driven them home by nightfall, if not sooner. It was believed that the search for the bodies had been a fruitless effort merely because the drowning must have occurred in mid-channel, since the boys, being good swimmers, would otherwise have escaped to shore. This was Wednesday night. If the bodies continued missing until Sunday, all hope would be given over and the funerals would be preached on that morning. Tom shuddered. Mrs. Harper gave a sobbing good night and turned to go. Then with a mutual impulse, the two bereaved women flung themselves into each other's arms and had a good consoling cry and then parted. Aunt Polly was tender far beyond her want in her good night to sit and marry. Sid snuffled a bit and Mary went off crying with all her heart. Aunt Polly knelt down and prayed for Tom so touchingly, so appealingly, and with such measureless love in her words and her old trembling voice that he was weltering in tears again, long before she was through. He had to keep still long after she went to bed, for she kept making broken-hearted ejaculations from time to time, tossing unrestfully and turning over. But at last she was still only moaning a little in her sleep. Now the boy stole out, rose gradually by the bedside, shaded the candlelight with his hand, and stood regarding her. His heart was full of pity for her. He took out his sycamore scroll and placed it by the candle, but something occurred to him and he lingered considering. His face lighted with a happy solution of his thought. He put the bark hastily in his pocket. Then he bent over and kissed the faded lips and straightway made his stealthy exit, latching the door behind him. He threaded his way back to the ferry landing, found nobody at large there, and walked boldly on board the boat, for he knew she was tenantless except that there was a watchman who always turned in and slept like a graven image. He untied the skiff at the stern, slipped into it, and was soon rowing cautiously upstream. When he had pulled a mile above the village, he started quartering across and bent himself stoutly to his work. He hit the landing on the other side neatly. This was a familiar bit of work to him. He was moved to capture the skiff, arguing that it might be considered a ship and therefore a legitimate prey for a pirate, but he knew a thorough search would be made for it, and that might end in revelations. So he stepped ashore and entered the woods. Well, the things is ours anyway, ain't they? Pretty near, but not yet. Huck. The writing says they are if he ain't back here at breakfast which he is, exclaimed Tom with fine dramatic effect, stepping grandly into camp. A sumptuous breakfast of bacon and fish was shortly provided, and as the boys set to work upon it, Tom recounted and adorned his adventures. They were a vain and boastful company of heroes when the tale was done. Then Tom hid himself away in a shady nook to sleep till noon, and the other pirates got ready to fish and explore. 